What's that? I think it's the eighth one. Oh, no, the bing bong. Yeah, it's like Heidi High. Right. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the continuation of the Education and Children's Social Care Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which was adjourned on 14th of September 2022 as a mark of respect to the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Before we start these proceedings, may I bring to your attention some housekeeping matters. There is no expected fire alarm testing today. Therefore, if the fire alarm sounds, please follow the fire but please follow the fire and emergency procedures which are applicable to the council house. Please, can I also ask that you use your microphone when addressing the meeting and that it's switched off when you're not using it and that your mobile devices are turned to silent. This meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of subsequent repeated viewing. By entering the War Spite Room and during the meeting, councillors are consenting to being filmed and to the use of those recordings for webcasting purposes. So we move to item one on the agenda, which is apology. Jake, have we got apologies? Yeah, apologies received from Councillor Tofan. Uh, apologies also received from Councillor Deacon. Councillor Salmon is substituting. Uh, Councillor Allen has provided apologies, and Councillor Tippett has substituted. Uh, could I give in Councillor Andrea Lovage's apologies, please? Making it do it right, sorry, apologies. Okay, so now we're going to move on to item two, which is declarations of interest. Do members have any declarations of interest in respect to the items on the agenda? Um, I just record that I'm a governor at Horizon Matt. Um, I don't know if anyone has any other declarations of interest. Okay. So uh, move to agenda item three, which is minutes to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on 15th of June 2022. Do I have someone to propose the minutes? Thank you, Councillor Free. Second. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pengelly. Chair's urgent business. Um, I don't have any uh, urgent business. So we move on to <coughs> tracking decisions, which is page nine and ten of the pack, which I'm just whizzing to. <coughs> Here we are. Bear with me. So. Um, so we start with 92 policy brief, progress complete, sent to members. Any comments on that? Um, Ming Zhang to respond to members of the education, sorry, 92 policy brief. Uh, Ming Zhang to respond to members of the education um, and children's social care committee in relation to Councillor Tippett's question, how much money is being outsourced on private therapy to meet EHCP requirements? Um, Sent to members on twenty uh, on second of the eighth, twenty twenty two. Does anybody have any comment on that? <coughs> uh, Ming Zhang to issue a request on behalf of the committee to multi academy trusts, requesting data in relation to the national tutoring program, in order for the committee to understand the impact on Plymouth and its children. Action sent to Ming for progression. Is there any update on that, Ming? Thank you, Chair. Indeed, yet I have some progress. Uh, we have contacted our school and also monthly material to collect data. I would say that not all material respond, but uh, we have a seven material respond. All school, primary school respond. Um, we do have a better picture on the take up our national tuition program. In Primus, uh, our average take up our uh, national tutoring program in the ac academic year 2021-22 was reported to 70.8%, which is much, much better than national average of 59.9%. So we have much higher take up our national tuition program. And in Primus, 66.7% was school led, and about 16% tuition is partner led. And 17.7, nearly 18% 18 academic mental led. Um, 
So we analyze those figures and then try to find out whether any school by using national tuition more than the other school will have a bigger impact on the outcome or not, because the national uh, attainment outcome um, had not been uh, formalized yet when we can gather those data. And we only base our own intelligence to see whether any school doing better by using the national tuition program. We haven't found any clear, clear evidence uh, but using the national tuition program better actually lead to better outcomes so far. But it's a very short period of time. Uh, we are analyzing it further. And we can report back uh, better to to next uh, school teaching panel meeting. Yeah, to answer the question, we have done this piece of work. Thank you. So, can, so if members agree, can we have that in a form that we can look at for the next scrutiny? Yeah, we can do. Yeah, thank you. So 93, Jean Kelly to circulate copy of Bright Futures document to all members of the Education, Insurance and Social Care Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Action sent to Jean for progression. I assume that's been sent. That is now complete, but uh, my apologies, that was a late uh, response, so that's now out. That's also on the... Uh, Plymouth Children Safeguarding website, so it is a public-facing website. Important that colleagues know that that's available there. Thank you. Um, 95 performance report, Jean Kelly to provide data in response to Councillor Harrison's query on how many children have stepped up from the child in need plan to a child protection plan, and how many children have successfully stepped down from the child in need plan to universal services. Um, this data is to be provided to Council for the next scrutiny and should also be reported within the next performance report. So um, at the point of the last scrutiny committee, we were in, we we'd transferred over to our new children's electronic system, Eclipse. Uh, in Care First, we couldn't report on the particular items that are being requested and we are building that report. It wasn't a uh, an urgent priority within the new Eclipse model, but it is being built so that we can report on that. At the moment, that would be a manual exercise uh, and not one that would be easily reportable. As soon as that's resolved, we will um, have that as part of this regular performance reporting. So in the last quarter, we had 106 children who uh, stepped up or down from child protection plans, but we would need to go through manually to look at um, uh, how, what that trajectory was either side. Um, if that's something that um, scrutiny committee want urgently, we will do that manual exercise, but we, we would ask that we um, allow time for that to be reportable um, within Eclipse. Thank you for doing that. Um, so there is the functionality within Eclipse to do that. Is that what you're saying? Um, we are creating the functionality within Eclipse to, to do that, yes, to be able to provide that report. You, it's, it's there in Eclipse. We just need to create the, the, the reporting mechanism to be able to draw that out from the system. So, so once that's created, once we get our performance report each scrutiny, that would be one of the things that's that right. re is reported on. Well, it's over to you, Councillor Harrison, really, whether you think you would like that one manual version of it done. I don't know what how, what kind of hours you're talking for that to be no, created. No, I'm, I'm happy for it, it to go through the system of Eclipse. I'm surprised that that information is not already readily available and monitored, to be honest. Um, but, uh, yeah, and that, and that it's not fun on the functionality of the system already. But if it can be uh, added in, then, then, then that would be um, useful just to be getting an idea. Thank you. Yes, Jean? I do want to offer some assurance that information is known and it is monitored. It's uh, What I'm talking about is reporting it as a whole cohort. So on an individual basis, children's um, child protection and child in need plans are monitored very carefully. There is quality assurance about that stepping up or stepping down, depending on uh, the level of risk, either increasing or reducing. So I don't want anybody to think that the uh, unavailability of an easy report indicates something more serious about our ability to monitor and uh, support children in the right way. Thank you. Um, the next one is to come to us to be put on the agenda for February 2023. 20, um, 
scrutiny, kickstart update, so I don't think we need to worry about that too much. Um, 97 citywide uh, youth services provision, provision um, for Dave Ryland and Martina Polina to endeavour to produce an app for the young people in the city of Plymouth. Um, we've talked about that scrutiny management board. I don't know if there's any update on that. Did I say anybody here that would be able to give us that? No. Okay. Well, can we, we'll, I'll, we'll follow that up from here and report back to the to members. And then the last one on the work programme uh, to provide data to the committee on children's results and inclusion prior to the scrutiny <coughs> meeting in November. <coughs> so obviously that's going to happen in November. So great. Okay. So that's tracking decisions done. So then we are on to uh, agenda item number six, um, the policy brief. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah Gooding, who is a policy and intelligence advisor to present this item to the committee. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Chair. This is a roundup of policy announcements and consultations relating to education and children since um, the committee last met in June. Um, I don't think I've got any announcements to update you on since the report, um, apart from the appointment of, or appointment of Kit Malthouse as the new Education Secretary. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions arising from the policy brief? Um, Councillor Brylesdale. Um, I just wanted to ask about the Ofsted announcement in July, which was about um, some statistics around vulnerable children often um, being placed um, on average 36 miles away from um, families. Um, it was interesting to read the report looking at the national statistics. So I was just wondering um, whether the data is readily available to look at the average distance for Plymouth um, individuals. That's not something I can provide an answer on, but I don't know if there's anyone else in the room. Do you go to Men? So we have provided this information regularly um, via scrutiny committee and uh, again we can provide that information um, uh, fairly immediately beyond this um, committee if that's helpful. We could make that request um, during committee to see if we can get it to you uh, now but it is uh, available and, and our, our picture is that um, uh, the majority of children are in or close to the city uh, with um, about a third of children looked after who are placed further from the city than 20 miles. So we would calculate it uh, more or less than 20 miles from the city boundary. So we'll get those exact figures to you, because I know that's not terribly helpful. Councillor Cree. Uh, with regards to the early years funding formula that they were, the DfE were seeking uh, consultation on, I'd be really interested to know how Plymouth City Council responded to that and given that I'm receiving a lot of concerns from early years people, what we're doing to prepare in case they change the funding formula to allow a different ratio. Thank you. Ming, do you want to come in? Oh, you're on mute. My apologies, Chair. Yeah. Uh, we did review the government proposal with our finance colleague. There are quite some positive proposals that we our view in it. Whether out of the consultation that will be realized or not, that's questioned. So I consult with our finance colleague because um, significant proportion of the proposal in it are positive, nothing contentious to what we intend to do. We decided not to propose anything differently from what government proposed to. We just want to fish. They would uh, go ahead to what we, they proposed to do. So I do have a, a paper uh, to go through each question to evaluate uh, whether we need to suggest something different or not. We come to the conclusion that uh, we mostly support the government's proposal. Is that something you'd like to see? Uh, yes, please. Can that be circulated to the members of this committee then? Yeah, please? Thank you. We did. We did, yeah. Have you got any further questions, Councillor Cree? 
only really yeah. that my, you know, some residents are talking about they're worried about the ratio changing and the safety elements of that, but you, you don't think there are any pressing safety concerns? Sharon would like to come in here. Okay. I think in, in terms of overall sufficiency and quality, our providers in Plymouth, um, the majority are good and outstanding by Ofsted. We do have a small but perfectly formed early years team that work with the sector. We look at overall sufficiency, so in terms of um, are we able to meet childcare needs across the various forms, not just obviously nurseries into, into childminding too. So there's a small team of three that look at that on a regular basis, looking at throughput, looking at headcount and making sure that we're able to provide that. Clearly, it's had its challenges over the COVID period. We've all you know, been aware of that, um, but we keep a very close eye on that. We have a requirement for a childcare sufficiency assessment, and that means that we're constantly looking to the viability of settings, supporting settings. It is a market that is currently, as you're probably all aware, very um, you know, subject to the cost of living issues as well, um, but we'll continue to keep a very close view and where we can support providers, we'll do that. In terms of the funding, um, Obviously, there's a lot of national lobbying around it, um, particularly around maintaining the nursery sector as well, where their um, requirements are higher. And again, we will continue to work with government officials in terms of the Plymouth position. Thank you. Councillor Cresswell. Can I, I, I don't know if I quite understand. Uh, so clearly we're, we're not too concerned then about changing from the um, one to four ratio to the one to five ratio. That's not something that is a cause of uh, Concern. I'm, I'm just thinking of something a bit wider in terms of the, the quality that can be provided, especially as far as um, early years um, learning is, is concerned and opportunities for children having um, wider learning, which might re require you know, taking them out of the, uh, of the setting that they're in or whatever. And knowing my experience as a teacher of the need to have a very high level of um, ratio to children uh, in those kind of um, learning and wider learning settings. Ming, do you have anything to add there? Oh yes, your hands up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just want to clarify further. I mean, in the consideration is more about money. Uh, in terms of ratio, uh, I do have a monthly, <coughs> monthly catch up with the DFV early year team and also the early year teams. That particular ratio issue we did raise, uh, I did raise with them about we want to make sure um, yeah, we get right. I think that's an outside of the consultation. Uh, we have that conversation with the uh, DFE. Just want to clarify that. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Harrison. I, I don't know whether it comes into it. Obviously, there are some concerns about sufficiency, um, especially uh, I've heard obviously overnight about sufficiency in terms of one of the early years promotions so is there anything that's happening from that point of view I mean I, I worry I, I echo what uh, Councillor Creswell um, and Councillor Cray have said regarding the ratios and the need for, uh, for early years uh, to, to, to have a good ratio is about safety um, but it's also about actually the children actually having a, a, a positive learning experience and not just being child um, minded, shall we say? You know, there's a difference which is between sort of actually giving them some positive positive experiences and supporting all the children. Sure. On the broad issue of sufficiency, I think we're okay. Um, and, 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 and with the, the example you're talking about, I'll pass over to Ming because I know they've done a specific, specific piece of work around that particular area in terms of demand. But as I said, it's an annual requirement and we continue to review that. Um, settings do open, settings do close, child binders, etc. So we have to keep a constant <coughs> view on that, but it, it's something that's regularly reviewed. Ming, if you could just pick up on that particular incident, that I think we've got a close level of detail around that particular postcode area. Yeah. Of course, thank you, uh, Sharon. Um, yeah, this particular area I assume refer to a setting. I wouldn't want to name the setting as here. That setting initially, um, we work with them. We normally early year, as Sharon said, a small team. We have two hundred ninety seven settings. So what we do, we advise them what the best practice, uh, how to provide better quality of service service. When there's a concern, we do work with them. In the part of this setting, uh, identify difficulty in recruiting at the only issue they have. 
the never being identified to us they have financial difficulty so last week but first day we call in to meet with the committee they do have committee because it's operated by a uh, by an independent independent charity and then it transpired at the meeting they are facing dire financial situation uh needing help so obviously the key consideration for us is children who need placement so we did the urgent local sufficiency review look at the area uh that review actually turned out we overall we have sufficient alternative places in other settings you will choose them from less value setting move into the other setting of course underneath that you will have some parents have difficulty they want to choose particular kind of setting they may want to choose setting similar to the one they attended before that's something we can give the parent advice and adding to financial challenge and while we're supporting the setting we attended committee meeting it transpire they do not have a registered person for child care setting that's legally required that's legally required although they were inspected by outset in 2018 in may 2018 as a good setting that's the not issue have been identified we 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 we, we, we think it they have someone register as a uh, responsible person and then when that person left they never feel that post and they never inform of that because this is not legally compliant and we have to have a duty to inform of that we informed of that yesterday immediately of that order the setting to close immediately yesterday so which is the right procedure uh, but the charity is itself can continue they still have committee we continue to work with them to support the parent by sending out the right message to make sure all parents have the contact point in pcc when they need advice and support from us and the team now make this case a priority and to work with the parent and also work with uh, in the other setting who would like to take the pupil from that very setting in trouble and like today we prepare a letter that send out to the setting to give them reassuring that you would like to take a pupil from that setting they will get the uh, entitled uh, funded places uh, money and they will. so let the insurance let's the insurance uh, other setting are seeking from us so that's been done also we're going to send out another letter today to explain further how uh, the local authority can help parents you will you will find it difficult to find alternative place um all being well organized i can give you reassurance that um we will min minimize uh, impact and any possible uh, negative impact on the parent thank you and um, before we move on council carlisle do you have any thoughts about ratios or that issue in particular um, no, actually, um, in fairness, Ming said pretty much most of it. We've sort of had a little discussion about it before, so I'll leave it with him. Thank you. Um, I, I, if no one's got any other questions, I just wanted to ask one question about the um, open consultation on the use of unregistered alternative provision, and it says that the um, council will be responding, and I just wondered if you could give me the kind of headlines of what, what our response was. Is that Jim or Ming? Sorry. Ming? It's for me. I mean, you, you refer to uh, education alternative uh, provision to uh, register. We, <clears throat> we do not use the unregister uh, alternative provision that much. I have to say that there's something to correct when you say that at that time we thought we may want to respond. But then look at that. I think we don't use. Uh, unregistered alleged, um, alternative education provision much. When there's a unregistered a provision, we will uh, provide a framework. Uh, they should not be used as a alternative to a registered school phase. They can only be used as a supplementary sort of activity, as extended activity of school. Children should not be removed from the registered school, registered setting, 
if to attend unregistered unregistered uh, setting that we don't have any people attend any unregistered uh, setting. So because of that, we did not respond with the end to the consultation. Right. Okay, thank you. So no other questions on the policy brief? No, then we can move on. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we will move on now to item seven, uh, which is Josh McAllister's independent review of children's social care. Um, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Councillor Carlisle to introduce it. If that's right, isn't it? Yeah, move over to, to Councillor Carlisle and then Sharon and Jean are going to um, be in support of our questions, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So the independent review report is a result of 14 months of intensive review of the way children's social care functions, drawing on the considerable consultation with a wide range of experience. Um, I'll just do a quote from the national report. This moment is a once in a generation opportunity to reset children's social care. What we need is a system that provides more intensive support to families in crisis, acts decisively in response to abuse, unlocks the potential of wider family networks to raise children, puts lifelong loving relationships at the heart of the care system to lay the foundations for those who have been in care. What we have currently is a system currently skewed to crisis intervention with outcomes for children that continue to be unacceptably poor and costs that continue to rise. For these reasons, a radical reset is now unavoidable. So this extensive report proposes a five-year strategic plan across seven key areas for national change. The review recommends the development and implementation of a national children's social care framework. So a government response is expected by the end of this year, and that's going to clarify some key issues. These include the report's call for legislative changes and significant financial investment of 2.6 billion. Uh, the committee here has asked for a briefing on how children's services responding to the review ahead of further announcements from central government. So we'll be handing over to Jean Kelly, Sharon Muldoon, Emma Crowther and Jane Anstis. They're going to be presenting an overview of the review, providing a focus on key themes that have been requested. Uh, formally, um, transforming care, focusing on placement sufficiency, the care experience, focusing on care leavers, and realising the potential of the workforce, focusing on recruitment and retention. So I'll pass over to them. Thank you. Um, so in the pack, you have um, four uh, documents that relate to this item. One is the briefing that I've completed that tries to uh, summarise 275 pages of uh, report. So um, necessarily it is it is brief, but hopefully it gives you the, the key headlines in terms of the enormity of the transformation that the independent review is proposing. Um, we then have uh, three uh, short presentations, one uh, for each of the key themes that you've asked us to focus on today, as uh, Councillor Carlisle has outlined. So the report itself, I'm going to say just a few things drawing from the, the briefing before I invite Emma to come up first to talk about placement sufficiency issues in terms of transforming care as a theme. There are 72 recommendations weaved throughout the whole report. Um, and about two thirds of those actually require government response, whether that's a change in legislation, whether that is an update to the mandatory statutory guidelines that we adhere to uh, within working together, or whether that is financially linked in terms of the 2.6 billion that, uh, pounds that Josh McAllister and his review team have indicated is needed to transform services through the four-year strategic plan that they he outlines as being required alongside a five-year plan to make those uh, changes happen. So these are not things that will happen overnight. These are changes that he believes will um, form the strongest possible foundations to transform what has been uh, a succession of incremental change over the last 30 years uh, since the Children Act um, came into force in 1991. So um, our efforts within Plymouth to respond to some of these recommendations are where we need them to be. We can go further and we welcome the challenge and the scrutiny in relation to our plans so far. Now, the review covers seven key themes um, from 
uh, a revolution in family help right through to ensuring that we are all relentlessly focused on children and young people and families in our systems. And um, uh, much of, of that requires uh, lots and lots of legislative change, I'm afraid. So when we talk about a revolution in family help and really integrating um, early help services for families with our statutory child in need approach, that does require a change to legislation because at the moment we're statutorily required to visit and respond to children on child in need plans in a way that we're not required to in terms of early help. So there are some significant issues that need to be dealt with and we cannot simply start to make those changes without that um, framework uh, to support us to do that. Um, we have made some real progress and continue to make some real progress in relation to uh, our care experienced young people. And I think you, when you hear uh, our response to that, you will see that we've really made some strides in the city before the review was published. The review supports our uh, efforts in that regard. We do have a recruitment and retention challenge within Plymouth. We've talked about this a number of times in a scrutiny committee before. However, we do not have a challenge that is more than uh, or more significant than other local authorities. In fact, historically, Plymouth has really managed recruitment and retention incredibly well. The pandemic um, altered that. Uh, to some extent and we haven't um, seen that correct itself since so you will hear about some of our approach to working with those issues locally and in terms of placement sufficiency which Emma's going to begin with in a second um, we have experienced real challenges it's why we have children placed outside the city and in residential care and in independent fostering agency foster care placements when ideally we'd have children placed within foster placements within the city as long as their needs uh, uh, were indicated needed that um, we have a challenge in recruiting foster carers you will see in the review that Josh McAllister calls for the recruitment of 9,000 foster carers up and down the country over the next, uh, I think his timescale for that was three years. There's lots of three years, four years and five years. So forgive me if I've gotten that one wrong. Um, but it's a challenge for every local authority. Um, Plymouth is not alone. That's not to abdicate our responsibilities in terms of all that we need to do. But there is a much bigger landscape that we need to consider as part of our response. So I'm going to, without saying more, I could keep talking or I won't, but uh, I want to hand over to Emma because she has some slides that we think might helpfully take you through where we are in Plymouth. Lovely, thank you, Jean. So I'm Emma Crowther. I'm one of the strategic commissioning managers for the local authority. Uh, my team uh, predominantly focuses on children and young people, uh, and that includes not only our strategic placement commissioning oversight but also our placement brokerage for our independent placement so literally finding the placements for individual children so just going to talk you through today some of the sort of strategic activity our challenges that Jean's already uh, touched on our local needs and demands and what we're doing about it most critically both locally sub-regionally and regionally and what else we need to do so I will take you through those Just to take us back up a level, first of all, a bright future, the children and young people's plan for the city does refer to some of our ambitions, although by no means all, related to our children in care. And that ambition particularly, as Jean suggested, to grow the number of uh, locally available foster placements for our children, uh, both in terms of numbers, but also in terms of skills and expertise, as well as making sure we've got a really broad range of other provision, like children's homes and 16 plus provision. Um, we also really, really, as Jean suggested, do want to make sure our children are able to live here, uh, remain in their schools, see their friends, see their families and maintain those links. I've set out on the slides, it is a bit small, I do apologise, some of the things that challenge us. So in terms of the things that are on our side, the tailwinds, we have really good working relationships with our local providers. Um, and they will go the extra mile for us and work innovatively and creatively, supported by really good working relationships with the social care team. There's a really dedicated placement workforce in there. 
So as an example, during COVID, if any of our children in the children's homes got COVID, the staff teams moved in. They left their own families and just moved in to be with our children without question, without hesitation. Um, and they're always willing to go the extra mile and try for us. Working against us, however, are a number of things, uh, not least the cost of opening and providing care and provision for us. So it's estimated to cost about a million pounds now to open a single children's home uh, because of all the associated costs of staffing, regulation, the building, etc. Uh, we have challenges in terms of the availability of placements to, to manage need, the broad range of need that we see, particularly complex needs. Um, and also the sheer volume of placements that we actually need, the choice that we need. We also know from our providers that um, Ofsted, while a very, very helpful way of making sure our placements remain of good quality, can act as a disincentive to take a risk, to take a child who's a bit of an unknown, where it might be a bit more of a challenge um, to, to care for them alongside other children. So that fe the sort of fear of an inadequate Ofsted judgment which can at times end a home manager's career if those inspections go poorly, can be a real disincentive. Again, really tiny diagram, I do apologise, we will send these to you. Uh, this in turn places significant strain on our system. So starting from the top, the blue box at the top, we know that foster carers are leaving the profession in greater numbers than they are joining. And that's a number of factors, so an ageing population, we found through COVID that more foster carers than we had anticipated have their own health vulnerabilities, and that caused significant concern. They also took time during COVID to reflect on their own lifestyles and their own priorities and whether they wanted to continue to foster. So that in turn leads to more children who have fostering needs being placed in children's homes. That then leads to less residential beds for children who need to be in residential but have more complex needs. And that, in turn, then leads to greater use of emergency, short-term, unregulated, bespoke provision. So you can see how that starts to push through the system. Then at the back end of that system, uh, and no less important, we have a real lack of suitable housing provision in the city for our care experience, young people to move on. And that then means they are then remaining in um, placement uh, longer than they need to which then again creates another block in terms of, of young people being able to move through into different sorts of placements to meet their needs. Put some data on the screen of some of our trends. So I looked back at April 2014 versus April this year, and it's a bit of a snapshot in time. Obviously there have been fluctuations through this, but you can see that we are seeing a trend of a lower number of children placed in our in-house fostering provision. Um, a higher and rising use of our independent sector fostering agency placements and a rising number of children's homes placements um, over those years. And these are all things that we are seeking to actively address. <coughs> In terms of our demand, uh, just to pick a couple of bits from this slide, so 10.6% of, of our children in care are in children's homes with 34% placed either in city or within 20 miles and that's a metric we're always trying to change. Those homes provide care for children with more complex needs. They are small homes. The biggest home we have in the city is three beds. The majority are one or two. Um, and uh, those models suit of care suit our children very well. And as I said, a million pounds to set up a new home is a significant cost. For independent fostering, 32% of our children in care are independent fostering placements currently. Uh, we know from the providers that we are now seeing 100 referrals for every single vacant bed nationally which makes it very, very challenging to be able to access those provisions and makes it very important that we are the best we can be in being at the front of those, um, those queues, if you like, for those beds. Those agencies are reporting and have been for some time an increase in, in younger children with the sorts of behaviours and complexities you would usually see in teenagers. So seven, eight, nine-year-olds um, are considerably often now more challenging to care for, which means a different set of fostering skills are required. And for our 16 plus placements, 6.3% um, of our children in care, our young people, are there. And those placements of children who have, young people have support rather than care needs. And there's a significant change coming in there that uh, those provisions will be offset registered from, uh, regulated from April next year. So the massive change in how uh, those homes will, uh, provisions will be assessed and monitored. And it will really tighten up that provision, which we really welcome. I'm sure Jean will want to come in on, on this one, I'm sure. Um, unregistered arrangements tend to be houses with staff teams that we put in around children. They are not provisions that we want to use. 
Um, they are also provisions that we are not allowed to use. They're illegal for children under the age of 16. We use them very sparingly when we absolutely have to. Um, and we always notify Ofsted when we do. And we let Ofsted know of the plans that we are taking to address this and move those children as quickly as possible into appropriate provision. There are issues driving the use of those types of arrangements. So we know that the welfare secure estate for children has 60 referrals for every vacant bed, so another uh, evidence of strain in the system. We know that challenges in accessing tier four mental health beds or alternatives where children have significant mental health needs but don't reach the threshold for tier four are challenging. Uh, we know that our providers, when we get to that sort of level of complexity of risk, really get very worried about taking our children and the unfortunate thing is the longer they stay in unregistered arrangements, the harder they are to then place. This also then often tips us into having to use deprivation of liberty safeguards because the staffing ratios in those provisions are really high, two to one, three to one, four to one, those sorts of things. And that does mean we're then starting to restrict a child's liberty. So we're very careful about how we monitor that, plan that, and make sure that all the legal protections are in place for those children. We're in the process of putting in place a provider framework for those staffing agencies that we use in crisis to really tighten up our expectations contractually to make sure they're very clear on what we expect them to do and the quality of the provision they provide for our children. In terms of sufficiency uh, and our plans, we work at various different levels. So we work regionally with the 14 Southwest local authorities. That's including the recent development of a regional market position statement for all of our sectors and some regional recommendations for projects that will take place at that level, including uh, one of the projects is around crisis provision and how we could do something at a much bigger scale. Sub-regionally, we're a long-standing partner of the Peninsula Commissioning Partnership with Devon, Somerset and Torbay. Uh, we're currently tendering our fostering and residential children's homes contracts through that mechanism. And locally, our arrangements include our residential children's home block contract called Caring in Partnership, which I'll talk about a bit more. Uh, provision around 16 plus, including our Complex Lives Alliance. And we're also in constant conversation with partners um, and others around new models, so crisis care models, and particularly a focus on new models of fostering for the city. A good news story is our children's home block contract in the city, where back in until I've been here too long at this point. Back in 2012, we had one home in the city that had two beds, um, and the provider always felt our children were too complex to place, so we rarely accessed those. Since then, we've done a significant piece of ongoing work to draw providers to the city, uh, initially on a framework contract basis, but now we commit to them through a block contract, and now we have 17 block contracted beds that are just for Plymouth children in the city, plus another eight beds that we can access, and that provisioning is growing all of the time. Uh, it's attracted some national attention, that arrangement, uh, more recently um, because of the positive outcomes for children, uh, but also the positive partnership working that helps to keep those placements as stable as possible. The providers describe all the children in there as our children. There's a genuine commitment. They're not seen as somebody else's children. They absolutely commit to them, our collective sense of corporate parenting. We see good outcomes there in terms of placement breakdown, stable placements, children being able to come back to the city, remain here in the first place, and move on to uh, fostering uh, and even return home. That's underpinned by really focused partnership meetings, which are extensively supported by colleagues in social care, the providers, CAMs, children care CAMs, and our virtual school. So we really wrap around those placements as much as we can. It's really based on a relational rather than transactional style of um, uh, working together. And that's really drawn out in Josh McAllister's report, really, about how you get really get alongside your providers and your partners. Um, we also have, as part of that, regular children's home manager forums in the city. It doesn't matter who you work for. You come along to those and you're part of that team. And we're seeing real uh, impacts of that. So our main block contracted provider, Keynes Group, their offset performance in the southwest, they have 64% of their homes graded good or above, and for Plymouth it's 100%. And that is directly attributable, they would say, to the partnership working and the quality of how we work together with those uh, providers and those children, and the confidence we can collectively give to those managers. I've only got two more slides, but I will stop, I promise. Um, so one more, uh, things, more, more we need to do, there's always more. 
We need to refresh our sufficiency plan for placement sufficiency so we're really clear on what we need going forward into the future. We are doing significant pieces of work around refocusing who is coming into the care of the local authority and why and how we could intervene early and make a difference. And that includes uh, looking at our early help offer, the front door, social work practice, etc. And also all our commission services and how they wrap around. We will be imminently recommissioning that residential block contract. Um, and again, emphasising that we want to encourage providers to come here and work with us. We really need to get more focus more quickly on fostering and how we grow that those local fostering uh, beds and encourage foster, foster carers or people who've never thought about fostering to come in and consider doing that with us. We need us to do a significant piece of work around housing, particularly for our care experience young people um, and having housing providers that really understand our young people but also give us more choice. We need to do pieces of work around transitions and how we support our young people with complex disability so they can live independent and happy adult lives. Um, we do really want to focus on reduction of those bespoke and unregistered placements. We absolutely <coughs> accept they are not to be used. Uh, another piece of work alongside all of this is the health and social care skills partnership in the city, which, which is there to support providers of employee, employers to bring um, staff into the social care system as careers um, and there's a careers fair I think taking place tomorrow which our fostering service is attending. So again we, we're part of those conversations about how do you make social care careers um, for children uh, something that people want to come and do. And Jean's touched on but we are awaiting the government response to the Josh McAllister review so we can continue to think about how we would embed those changes. That was my last slide, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we'll take questions after each because they're kind of distinct um, subjects. So do you have any questions? <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's just important, um, just as an overview for me, in terms of this is my fourth month and the area that Emma's just taken us through is obviously really of a critical focus for us. Just to give it some more assurance, a part of the work I've done is also looking at how we're faring in Plymouth against our partners in the South West, but also colleagues that I've worked with elsewhere. And it's a sense of just calibrating where we are, what's currently happening in Plymouth, what our plans are, what our responses have been to date and what we're doing next. And for me, it was a, make, a way of just sort of gauging where we are, making sure that we're not missing anything, that we haven't um, not thought about something that we should have done, but also our direction of travel and our progress and take rating or assessing our relative performance. So just as a degree of confidence for the team and recognition of them, we are absolutely doing the things that we need to do. We know we fundamentally, and Emma's just alluded to it, do much more in the city with our partners around early help, particularly thinking about our adolescents. I've been out to the school this morning just to try to understand how can we work better in communities so when that first need arises, we go in together and support together so that we don't have some of our children escalating into the care system. So I just wanted to give that, that overview, really, that I'm very proud of the work that the team have done today. We are going to be absolutely relentlessly focused in reducing those children that are in care that perhaps could have been better supported elsewhere. It is a local authority role, but it's also a role that we all need to play in terms of the community structures that we have, our relationships with our early year settings, our schools, and also how we work <coughs> alongside health colleagues. So I just thought it's important just to give that strategic overview and, and also just to validate the work of the team. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so I've got Councillor Tippett and then Councillor Creswell. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my question is, uh, have we identified why uh, more children are coming into our services with complex trauma needs? And is there anything we can do to help address that? It's a national trend. Um, it isn't unique to Plymouth. Um, but actually, what, what is available to us is our local response and how we do that. Um, and that's about working in that real partnership strength across the system. It's not unique to Plymouth, and I think we've just outlined in terms of how we're seeing some of our children at a much earlier age. That is happening, it's happening nationally, but it's incumbent upon all of us to understand what more we can do, and that's exactly what we will be doing. I don't know if you want to say anything, Jean. Yeah, I, I would concur with that. I think it, additionally, 
we are much more informed about the way in which early trauma impacts on children's development and on their outcomes. And therefore, I think there's a lot more earlier identification of that. Uh, and sometimes we identify that much later for young people who haven't come to our notice before. So I think those, but a combination of those factors uh, are driving it. And that's as true in Plymouth as it is anywhere else. So just, just to add to that, what is, over the years I've been here, having seen how the fostering offer has evolved, we're now seeing almost a standard in our fostering agencies, therapists, clinicians, the sort of wraparound support for the foster carers, also the child, and some real innovation in that space. And that's because they have absolutely, as Jean said, they're recognising trauma earlier, but they are learning to respond to that. And their training programmes are different for foster carers now. The um, skills the supervising social workers have to have and the length of it, the sort of inquiry and understanding. So something that in past years might have been dismissed as bad behaviour is absolutely now recognised for the trauma that's driving that which is really welcome. We were just finishing the Peninsula Fostering Tender, and I was one of the evaluators, and seeing the difference and the transformation in how those agencies, that's just what they do now. The, the, that's really rooted in what they do, which is really helpful to see. And just also to, also to add back in the partnership lens, um, how we work with schools in terms of outreach and supporting inclusion, understanding, supporting the school system, the staff in the school, the anxiety, um, so really, again, just thinking about we have some tremendous strengths in our special school estates. We were ahead this morning saying, how can we use your skill set to support other settings, to support our children earlier on? So it's that whole system approach, not, not just when we get to residential care, but absolutely through that early identification of need, supporting the whole of the children's workforce, but also creating the strength in our mainstream universal services to really support our children. All right, Councillor Tibbets. Yeah, that's all good on that question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pleasure. Yes, I, I think uh, I can only uh, praise the uh, local authority and the staff team in Southampton and this um, trauma-informed approach and all sorts of things. But the issue I really want to ask is about the, um, the one of our key recommendations, £2.6 billion to be invested in the next four years. And what is the likelihood of that actually strategically um, happening um, and uh, I bear in mind um, my particular area of interest I had as I can remember when uh, Sir Kevin, uh, Kevin Collins um, the uh, education recovery czar actually put forward a budget for education recovery following Covid um, a figure he put at about sort of 15 billion actually got whittled down to a tenth of that of 1.4 billion so that is, and that's a deeply, I think, political question that is, in some ways, sort of directed at more at you, really, Councillor Carlyle. Thank you very much, Councillor Cresswell. In all honesty, I think it's as you said, when you first heard about the 15 billion and then that got whittled down, is something we'll all we'll, we'll know as time goes on. I can only hope that it will be the 2.6 billion that we will, that will be happening. But again, I mean, I'd just be pulling a figure out if I said anything otherwise. Do you want to come back? Um, something that I was hoping the chair might be able to evaluate on or whatever is that what can we do to actually um, push on that? What are you doing, your party that's actually in, in power? What is there that we can do to actually push back and, and push on that? I'd ask the chair, in fact. I mean, I think as a committee we could write to Kelly Tolhurst, who's the new children's minister. Um, I know when the recommendations first came out, it was discussed that the government's response would be out in the autumn. Obviously, there's been quite a few education secretaries and children's ministers um, since the report. So the fact that now we're, you know, we're being told it will be some time towards the end of the year, obviously for people like us who are interested in this, it's an absolute priority. And I think that um, until we know where we are, which recommendations the government's going to adopt and which it isn't. Um, yes, you know, we can carry on working as we are in Plymouth and, and we, we quite often are working in line with jo what Josh McAllister has said anyway. But in any event, if the, if the committee were in agreement, I would like to write to Kelly Tolhurst to say, um, we don't want any more drift on this. You know, I was looking forward to, to hearing what the government had to say about it now. Um, 
and that we endorse the recommendations, the work of um, Josh McAllister's committee and you know, we don't want the government's response to be any later than um, the end of this year and that we thoroughly endorse the, the um, calculation that Josh McAllister has done that we need at least 2.6 billion to get this right, both so that we get the best things for our children but also for local authority budget. So um, if committee members are in agreement with that, I'd like to write a letter on that basis. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I thoroughly agree with that. I think um, this is one of the most important things that the council does, is to look after our children. And um, I know it takes a huge part of the budget, you know, um, but but it's something that we just have to do. And I thoroughly agree with you, Chair, that we should write and make a really strong case that we do think this is terribly important. You know, um, there's nothing else that this council does that's more important than this. And I firmly believe that. Councillor Colour. I'll just add in, actually, I've already been in contact with um, Kelly Tolls on, on other subjects as well. So obviously we had the conference recently. I attended a Bernardo's reception and we made contact there. And we've been speaking to us about her coming down here to visit anyway. So I think we're very much on her radar with various subjects that I brought up with her at the time. So I think, yeah, definitely if we can write the letters forward to her as well. Thank you. Councillor Tippett. Um, just, uh, my question is about the, the strain system uh, graphic that we had and it said about uh, young people uh, remaining in provision longer than they need to and I just wanted to bring the child's voice into this with my question about what provisions are we putting in if they want to stay longer uh, because of course uh, you know, I know as a, a 21 year old uh, that adult life is still sometimes very confusing so what are we doing to make sure that they've got that more um, advanced support if they need that and there's not any particular identified needs there for them yeah we're, we're working on that all the time it's a really good question so there's a number of uh things in place there's staying put which enables children in foster placement to stay in their foster placements post 18 um to be able to uh as you would in a family it's a family so they'd be able to stay with their foster parents mm -hmm. and um spend that time we have our placement providers for residential and 16 plus in the city are brilliant at staying in touch and having our young people back uh, once they have moved on. There's very careful planning. I know Jean will come in on this around the right time for children to move on to link with their needs. Um, but we've also just a new initiative for us in the last month. We've opened uh, with a partner in the city, an 18 plus five bedded home, um, which is designed very specifically for those young people who are ready to move into something more independent but not entirely out and so that enables them to stay in a provision for up to six months but it is flexible to be able to really plan with them their next step their move ons it also has practical changes like the staffing hours change to give them more independence but to make sure that they have the support when they need it so the staffing is configured around there being people there in the evening and overnight for them because that's when you have conversations with your children isn't it when you're making tea uh, when you're sitting and watching telly together so it's very carefully thought out about the experience of young people and how you wrap around what they need when they need it but i know i'm sure you'd want to come in here um the the comment that i'd add is that uh, when we're talking about um this issue within the strain system um uh, graphic that you see we're really talking about those young people who are ready and want to move on um that that they are remaining in settings that um, don't uh, meet their needs any longer and and they're ready um, there isn't the provision for them within an adult um, framework so whether that's independent accommodation or uh, other provision to support them to make those um, steps in their lives that they need to and want to take so this isn't about um, changing things for children with on young people without their voice being uh, really closely listened to and when we talk about um, the care experience Jane will very much uh, help you understand how closely we've been listening to young people's uh, voices in respect of how we support them uh, in a lifelong way, um, not just around placement uh, sufficiency issues, but much more holistically than that. Thank you. Um, I've just got one quick question then, Sally. Um, in terms of fostering recruitment, um, 
I know we need to, over, you know, we need to bring new people into fostering, definitely. What can we do that's allowable in terms of um, persuading, if that's the right word, um, foster carers who are working with independent fostering agencies to come and, come and be local authority foster carers? Um, this is an issue that we have um, uh, thought about in local authorities forever. Um, we, we cannot directly market um, independent fostering agencies, and neither should we. Um, we actually rely on our independent fostering agency uh, foster carers to provide an invaluable support that works alongside uh, a range of provision in the city. And there are key fostering agencies that we've got some really good working relationships with. And the last thing we want to do is to unsettle or undermine those really great relationships um, to support children who perhaps have more complex needs, who can live in families, but might need that specialist uh, fostering resource. So I think one has to always be careful about that. I think what we try to do, and are trying to do more and more, is to really capitalise on what Plymouth does well in terms of fostering and the support that is afforded through a local authority system of foster care. Because the infrastructure is much stronger in terms of staffing and the mechanism to support um, foster carers through training um, and the number of people that can wrap support around a, a child in their foster carers care. So what we need to do is really market those um, unique selling points and really make sure that, that anybody, including foster carers who might already be fostering elsewhere, whether it's another local authority or whether it is for uh, an agency, understand that so that they can make the best choice for them. And I think that is the, um, the way that we need to do that within a professional framework that respects um, the fact that we have a, uh, a multiple approach to placement um, finding. Well, I, I just come back. I just um, and I, obviously I understand all that. So maybe it's about at the point of making that choice to whether whether you get become a local authority carer or an independent fostering agency carer. Just being really clear that that we have, as you said, we have a USP. So we want at that decision point, we want to be the per we want mm. to be the people that people decide to go with. Sharon, um, as an area that we want to do more and, and be better at in our ambitions. Um, we looked at the fostering service <clears throat> and looked at um, actually how do we support the existing fostering team and really making a distinction between the commercial marketing activity and the business generation aspect of the service against the absolute social work practice and the supporting of families. So we, we have um, an improvement area around that and we are going to be looking at that commercial skill set and really making sure that we have, and particularly without sounding a bit too fuddy-duddy, in today's digital world, that we are really responsive and as commercially aggressive in that space um, as, as maybe perhaps our private sector partners are. The other aspect is just absolutely reinforcing what Jim was saying about, you know, the place of Plymouth and the community of Plymouth and really building on that in that emotive hearts and minds way. So we will absolutely look at, at, at making sure that the fostering service has the right skill sets on both parts, um, that we do our social work practice really well in there, but we've also got the absolute skill set to be aggressive where we need to be and be proud of what we can and reach out through various channels, and we will be doing that. Chief? Just one last comment. Um, we do recruit foster carers from independent fostering agencies, so it is happening, and this year probably more than in previous years. So our marketing and our making sure that people understand what we offer is getting out there. So children who might be placed um, with independent fostering agencies, those are foster carers then learn and experience what we can offer and what we do do. Uh, and that has encouraged some to uh, apply to join us as a local authority. So it is happening. Thank you. And we are top of the Google search now, which we certainly weren't a couple of years ago. And I think some in this place, because that's really important. OK, thank you. So, uh, sorry, Councillor Cuzzo, be very quick, because we're going to be running over time in a minute. Um, I, I particularly uh, was interested in um, doubling the proportion of um, care leavers attending high tariff universities by 2026. And a particular reference as well there to the role of the virtual school head. And we did have quite an interesting discussion at corporate parenting on that whole issue of looking at uh, the data uh, as far as um, our children in care were, were concerned. 
But what is an issue that does uh, arise there? It says about the uh, virtual school head being held accountable for the education of children for children in care. The, the difficulty with that is that which we came across by looking at the um, <coughs> look, looking at uh, some of the issues involved is the fact that, of course, schools are um, the model of math doesn't necessarily make it very easy for the virtual school head to actually be held responsible accountable because they don't have the same sort of level of accountancy, accountability as if you were actually a head of your own school. So I just wondered uh, if that's an area to be explored and what we can do about it and um, what other powers or whatever we were able to give the uh, virtual school head. Um, I think it, it speaks to the more wider issue of inclusion and supporting all of our vulnerable learners. Um, and we are absolutely, again, relentless in terms of understanding the who, the what, the when, the why, and having those conversations. <clears throat> As a system leader, that's for me and the team to look at the data and under understand, working with virtual school head, you know, what's happening for our children in care and how we best support them. There's also, and um, we, we will have citywide data around that, which will be much more responsive. Every two weeks we'll have a feed, so we'll be absolutely able to see that. It's really important that our virtual school head has those relationships and of course, we, we know where our children are placed and we have our independent reviewing officers who will absolutely be looking at all aspects of outcomes for our children in care. So it's really about the whole system working around that. Um, but it's also the, you know, our role, my role, Jean's role in terms of how we lobby where we need to. So if we see things we're not happy, happy about, our relationship with our regional director, the Department for Education, so that we can absolutely promote the cause. We do it individually for each and every child, but if we can see patterns where we believe our schools aren't as inclusive, then we should absolutely be challenging and our new data feed will help with that. I think in terms of broader outcomes and back to the sufficiency, it, it's essential that we keep our children in care in the city where it's right and appropriate to do so because it means our strength as a city is much better. We do know when our children are out of county, out of city, particularly those that are older, then obviously um, getting them a school place and the right school place is more difficult. So the two are very closely aligned, actually, um, in terms of that city's response. Thank you. I mean, mm. I, I, I accept all that. I, I think one of the things that came out at our, our corporate parent meeting was about the issue of the um, role of the, um, of the DT and um, PEPs. And, uh, Do you want to say what those two things are? Sorry, sorry. The, um, <coughs> the, the designated teacher and um, the personal education plan. And those were... You know that, that that is an issue which I know that the uh, I, I know that the uh, virtual school head is, is well aware of and is you're very well aware of because that's actually within the plan. But that is something that I think perhaps needs to be sort of like incorporated and um, and support given because it's uh, it's obviously quite quite a tricky one. And probably when you start to dig down deeper, you probably find there's an issue with some specific schools, whereas other schools have a much more well. Um, designed and uh, effective system. Thank you. Um, if there's no other questions on this, Jean, are you going to talk about the um, recruitment? I wonder if, because we're because we're a bit tight for time, if you just went through the key activities in progress slide, is that okay? And yes, so Jane Anstis is going to okay. join us. And, um, Thank you, Jane. And we also have the care experience, so we will uh, we'll yeah. go through that as quickly as yeah. we can. I mean, I'm hoping everybody has read all this, you see, so, yeah. Afternoon. Um, I'm hoping I'm going to be ably assisted by Karen Blake, Head of Service for Permanency, who's sitting behind to my left. Um, so I think Karen's going to share slides. And while she does so, I'll just introduce myself. So um, I'm Jane Anstis. I'm the Practice Improvement Lead for Children, um, Young People and Families and until recently been in a head of service role in permanent. Um, and so really the reason I'm speaking today to you on the subject of children in care and care experience, young people, in terms of the review. But I'm going to begin, and I am really mindful of time, Chair, so happy to kind of receive a, a trigger to move on if I'm blowing up too much. I'll move through them at, um, at some pace. Um, thanks, Karen, you could move the slide on. So uh, you see here the headlined um, findings of the review, um, and I'm going to just um, um, set out for you today how these findings correspond to the work that we're already embarked on, um, our perspective on the challenge that is set within the review, 
um, and where that takes us in terms of our local authority response. The context of this review, as the context of our own independent review that I'll touch on, is unprecedented, as we all know, um, both in terms of um, some of the global uh, realities that we are operating, recovering from and still operating within, and also in terms of the professional landscape of social work. So in the context of um, a professional reality where 69% of social workers leave the profession within the first five years, that's a national uh, reality, not a Plymouth reality, but it's very similar for Plymouth. Um, we knew long before we had this independent review um, that we had some significant challenge to work through. I think the promise of this review and our own work is there's a great opportunity here actually to do better for our workforce and to do better therefore for stability for children and families. Um, and we don't want families experiencing saying their stories again, us starting our work with them again, delays for children and young people. So we're talking today about workforce, but actually um, that's the outcome that is served by getting our workforce response right. <coughs> Thanks, Karen. <coughs> so our current position, um, as you can see, um, and I just want to take you to a couple of headlines in this. As Jean touched on earlier, our vacancy rates um, historically in Plymouth have been lower and consistently so um, than the majority of local authorities for the past few years leading up to 2020 and the um, obvious events of that spring that year. Um, and you'll, you'll see in a moment um, that our <coughs> challenges really began um, to climb in the year of 2020 and peaked over the summer of last year. But something I do want to say about this, is there is some good news that sits behind some of this data, even though we look as though we are 21% uh, vacancy rate against a national average of 16.7. So we have invested, thank you, Jean, we have invested um, in a new <coughs> team. So that's eight social workers, one team manager. And so for the purpose of this data, that's nine qualified social work posts in terms of how this is counted. So if you discount that, our vacancy rate then is about the national average. It's 16 point, uh, very tired, 16.8. Um, and so that is some good news for us. It's not exactly as it seems, um, but that is still a significant challenge and over where we've been um, historically for the last five or six years pre-pandemic. I'll come back and uh, talk um, shortly about newly qualified social workers and the work that we're doing around overseas recruitment. Um, but just to, to flag it at this early stage. Thanks, Jean. Um, so you'll just see here on this uh, sort of headline data what I just spoke to, which is a peak around, um, a peak turnover in the summer um, of July last year, um, and some sort of levelling off and levelling down of that, actually, um, uh, over the recent uh, six months. But as I've said before, that doesn't mean that we don't have significant pressures, and particularly they are centred in, in some areas over others. So in the centre part of our services, social workers providing services to children who are in, who need um, a medium term response, sometimes a longer term response. So in need of protection and those children who are not able to live safely at home and are potentially in court proceedings and moving into permanent care outside their family. So that's where we see that uh, concentrated effect. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Karen. So, uh, Jean, don't. Um, <coughs> um, so the, the review highlights six recommendations. Um, and um, what I've presented for you today is, um, in a couple of slides time, is how our internal local review sits against those review findings. Um, but just so that you um, have it in your minds for that, so the review talks about developing expertise, it talks about reducing reliance on agency staff for the same reasons that we've just spoken to in terms of increasing stability and relationships, um, stability for children and families, tackling bureaucracy, supporting the development of key pathways such as family support workers and leadership, particularly around in children's homes, but also more widely across the system. Um, 
And we really welcome those recommendations uh, because they align very closely to our own findings through um, the review that we undertook, which was a very um, unflinching look at our challenges um, undertaken towards the back end of last year and early this year. Um, and in doing that piece of work, we looked uh, both at the global picture, across sector, across industries, and also uh, with a narrow focus, as I said, in terms of our own sector and industry and our own local geographical area. We also distilled the key findings that we'd seen from our exit interviews, from our staff forum. So we've gone into some considerable detail in understanding our picture um, in our own workforce. Um, and I want to just say something about some of the key findings from that. Um, so I've said something already about um, the, the unprecedented nature of our situation as it was in 2020 and, and still now. Um, and we know that that has resulted in disruptions across all industries. So this isn't a social work um, phenomenon solely. Um, employees and managers were reporting the highest resignation rates on, on record. Um, Emma spoke, uh, touched on the impact for foster carers in terms of thinking about um, life choices and, and um, that balance between home and work. Um, and uh, consistently, the research around that across industry speaks to culture and well-being, so people making decisions predicated on those different priorities. Uh, similarly, the emergence of a digital market um, increasingly, and that's given rise to a number of um, key issues for us. One being the emergence of more uh, of a wider market nationally, so social workers could choose to work from uh, Aberdeen in Devon, and that really disrupts the whole landscape in terms of recruitment, both interim and locally. Um, <clears throat> but there's also some real advantage in that, and I think we've learned a lot in terms of creating balance and opportunities for staff um, to manage their lives differently. Um, I've talked a bit about the shortage of social workers. Um, just something else I want to point out around an interim staff picture. So that's changed significantly over the last two years. Uh, the McAllister Review really speaks to that in terms of the monetization of um, the system, both at, in terms of care for children and also for um, uh, staffing. Um, you will be aware that we have had um, project teams and managed teams as an interim solution that we're just exiting from. That's been a very positive experience for us. Um, and um, our exit plan for that is um, predominantly overseas recruitment and really building um, our response to the retention. <coughs> Um, and we know that there's some internal work that we need to do also in terms of the conditions and the experiences of our workforce. Um, social work as a profession, again, this isn't a Plymouth um, phenomena, um, is an industry that experiences um, a high degree of occupational trauma and impact. Um, and we really need, and we know we need to really address that in a very robust and thoughtful way in terms of how we support our staff to not only survive their work, but thrive in their work and to feel fulfilled working for Plymouth and want to be here. Thanks, Karen. <coughs> um, so we are now positioning ourselves to deliver that um, in terms of um, our aspiration to really be a um, headline trailblazing authority um, where staff satisfaction is really clear. We can measure it, we can see it, we can hear it, and their well-being is high. Um, and all, and all of the consequence benefits for the workforce and for families in that. Thanks, Karen. <coughs> you could move through that one, actually. Thanks, Karen. So our action plan, um, which is still um, under development, but I've just um, referred you there to, um, <coughs> these are headline priorities, of course, the first three being really about how we retain and build the right climate and conditions for our workforce, and the latter two, priority four and five, really looking outwards in terms of recruitment, some of that um, language that Sharon was just using in terms of a really aggressive and um, progressive approach to um, recruitment um, and um, being active in that recruitment space and market. <coughs> and ensure, ensuring we've got the right conditions to really focus on that sustainably over the coming years. And you can see from the um, numbers in brackets how well this aligns to the independent um, 
the view for children's social care in terms of their aims and aspirations as well. So it's a really close fit there. Thanks, Pam. So just finally then to say a couple of headlines of where we are. So we are in the middle of an overseas recruitment. Um, we are just in the very thrust of that at the moment. Um, <coughs> so just moving into an interview and selection phase. Um, and um, even since this slide pack was brought together, we've also um, developed our, excuse me, it's not, it's not, as, <coughs> it's not as mopey as being here, Joshua. Um, <coughs> we've also developed a um, early career framework, which is one of the other recommendations that's set out in the room. It's really important when you think about that first five years that I just referred to for our newly qualified staff. I'm going to pause there. Um, I think that's enough for me, probably, in terms of time. So, happy to take Thank any you. questions. You want to share? I wanted to just talk a bit to the culture as well. Okay. Yeah, I just thought I'd supplement that. Um, so, over, over my last sort of three and a half months, I've obviously walked the floor a bit and had a, um, a two service design events where we've spoken to social workers, and I did a director's Q&A the other day, just asking for any questions to come up. Workforce is um, obviously quite paramount. We've got lots of data, and, and I think it's there's a number of things that I think are positives to Plymouth, which is um, we retain our staff really well. So where we do have staff moving on, Jane's identified two teams where we do see a lot of throughput. But when you look at where those people go, they're often, and the majority, are staying in Plymouth, but maybe moving into the fostering service or into the independent reviewing service <coughs> or elsewhere. So in terms of our retention levels, we are below um, or above the national average in terms of our performance. We have had, and I know the workforce talk about agency staff, and we did, it, obviously, as uh, Jean's outlined and Jane's outlined, a period of time where we needed to do that. We are moving away from that, and our vacancy rate, whilst high, is high because we've invested in these posts in the service. However, listening to our workforce and our social workers in particular, but not exclusively, there is an issue around what they're doing and how they spend their time. And there's a very clear view that sometimes they're doing things that they think others should be doing. So we're absolutely looking at that as well in <coughs> terms of their roles and their responsi responsibilities, the use of family support workers and other type roles, and including commissioning services to best support them. This will culminate in a new recruitment and retention strategy, which is my intention will be available by the end of November, subject to a number of uh, final checks. I am very confident that we will have a much more stable workforce and within that recruitment and retention strategy we will absolutely have new and supported career pathways so that um, we absolutely support and grow our own in Plymouth because we know the evidence tells us if you train in Plymouth and from Plymouth you're likely to stay in Plymouth. Um, so really thinking around how we do that and it will be informed by the, the view from our, from our workforce. So I think it's, this is a picture in time. I am confident we will move forward and again calibrate some of those approaches um, and looking at what others are doing in the southwest. One thing I'm really clear about is we, we can't just keep on trying the same thing. So we do need to think about actually um, agency workers and agencies converting into permanent. It doesn't really happen. It's a lifestyle choice. So we need to think about creating our workforce. And within that, thinking about the ageing work profile as well. So that we're really looking long term to stabilise the workforce. Thank you. Um, and I apologise, Councillor Poyser, because you were, you wanted to ask a question at the end of the last section. Has the, has the moment passed? OK. Um, so do we have questions? Councillor Cree and then Councillor Harston. Um, I think it's probably a little bit at the tangent, but when I, when I read this, and um, I'm quite sure that you are doing these things, but to a non-expert, what have we got in place, given that we've got 43 posts vacant, to make sure that our children are really safeguarded properly and that, like really bad things don't happen? I'm, I'm sure you do do it, but I, I just don't know what, what that looks like. Thank you. Um, so we do use agency staff to cover uh, vacant posts. Um, and uh, that is something that we um, have no option to do because we want to, precisely as you ask, ensure that we're safeguarding children in the best way that we possibly can. So that, and we've created new social work posts and currently they are covered by agency staff while we're recruiting to those permanent posts because we are committed to caseloads that are, are a, a low enough level that social workers can really focus their intention on 
quality intervention to support best outcomes for children, to reduce risk, to build safety, all the things that you would expect us to do as a service. So we have cover through agency staff to manage as much of that as we can. So um, when you have agency people in, do you have ways of working to ensure consistency so that if you're having a, you know, make sure that all of the information is handed over and, and just because one person dealt with it then and then another person dealt with it another time, something miss, it gets missed? So we have well-established ways of um, handover and transfer between social workers. It's a well-established issue, if you like, in social work practice because different teams will support children at different times. So our, we have a very clear transparent transfer process that requires joint visits. It requires handover of key information. It requires good communication and information. And that would be exactly the same with an agency member of staff coming in as it would with a permanent member of staff. And agency staff are supported in the same way that permanent staff are, same supervision um, requirements in terms of management oversight, the same requirement to come to team meetings, to report in exactly the same way. They are expected to behave and perform as any other social worker in our service. Thank you. Jane. Thank you. I just want to add to that. Um, so what, one of the things that um, we're very, very focused on is that, it, you know, we're talking about numbers here, cohorts of children, but actually every one of those individual children um, is known to us. Um, social workers actually have a very um, keen um, understanding of the children that they're working with. And so in those decisions around actually what are the individual circumstances and needs of those children, young people, um, and what are the timings of the work that we're engaged with them um, is really relevant to how we make decisions about allocation and, and which social workers at what stage and what stage change can happen for children and young people. And the other thing I'd just like to say is that um, uh, in terms of handover, our approach to overseas and our approach to those managed teams that I've spoken about is to take a tapered approach, an incremental approach. So as new workers come in, we can release workers and that means that we can really do that handover work um, in a meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harris. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of ones. One, one relates to the agency. Um, in terms of the amount of time that an agency worker might be working with a family um you know is uh, and you you mentioned just now um that obviously you think about who who you place with a family because you know some families uh, will require quite a, you know consistency you know um in in a previous work life you know um i i'm well aware that some families really struggled if they were constantly given different workers um, and, you know, agency staff, um, you know, and so that basically they, you had that thing about having to tell the story again or just not feeling like actually they, their, their, their needs were, were responded to. So, so my, you know, so I have a, a query about, you know, is there a length of time or agency staff just like, oh, we just need you for a few weeks or is there more of a, like, you're going to be with us for six months, nine months, a year, uh, and, and therefore there's a bit more consistency there in, in terms of the approach and not moving from one to the other. So I think um, the picture is um, quite complex. Um, we've had experience of uh, agency members of staff being with us for a year or more. Um, that was purposeful. Uh, during the pandemic, we had a managed team, and that team initially were due to stay with us for six months. Recruitment didn't um, supplant in terms of permanent workers. That team remained with us for a year, and they did some incredible work with children in terms of improving outcomes. There will be other situations where agency staff will say, stay with us for less time than that, not necessarily because that's what we plan or would want for children, 
but actually, if we do appoint somebody permanently, we will let those colleagues go. The cost of agency staff, as you will know, is significant, and we're very mindful of that expense. And we have to balance that with the needs of children. So, so it's not as simple as saying, we will say you can stay for this length of time. We will balance that with our permanent recruitment needs. But in the main, when social workers come to us as agency staff, they regularly want to stay for as long as we want them to stay. Um, we rarely get that really high level of turnover where people might come and then go after a few weeks. And that would not be our intention in the first instance with them in any event. And actually, if we appoint to some posts, we might move those colleagues into other positions so that they can support us wherever our vacancies might continue to persist. I just, I just wanted to add, you know, in, in terms of things like staff absences, because obviously you talked a lot about recruitment and retention, but clearly, you know, the, the, uh, the nature of the work means that there might be more staff absences than maybe other types of work because of the, the, the workload, the stress um, involved. Uh, is, is that taken into account when you're thinking about how, you know, you talked about exit interviews, but are you also thinking about actually the, ob the absences, you know, some, some work? So, yes, we have very few um, colleagues who are off long-term sick uh, in terms of qualified social work staff. But there, there is an issue related to the stress, uh, the stressful nature of the work that we do. Uh, and that can be a reason for people to be unwell at times. When, when colleagues are off for longer than a, a few weeks or a month, uh, when that does happen, we do look to reallocate children's cases so that they can be supported while that, that individual is off. If they then return, then we'd look at transferring that child, uh, that child back to that social worker because they know them, have an established relationship. So we try to be flexible and thoughtful about how we do that so that it doesn't interrupt children's development and progress and, the pa and their parents' support and progress. But we do need to make those decisions to ensure that we fulfil our statutory duties and that we do that to the best of our ability. Uh, but as I say, they're not significant numbers who are off sick for that length of time requiring that uh, intervention. Thank you. Um, Councillor Crystal, I'm not going to add you to the list because I've still got three more people and we're, we really need to move on in a minute. So Councillor Pengelly, then Councillor Poyser and then Councillor Sumner. Thank you, Chair. Um, it says in the report that social workers have told the review that rather than spending time with children and families, they spend most of their working day on administration. And um, I know they have to have, to have good records and what have you, but I found that in teaching that, and Sally will understand this, the higher up the ladder you go, the more admin you do, and you see less of the children. And I'm wondering if that's something that's simple that could be changed. It's absolutely something we're looking at. Because um, it's so important. I'm sure when they leave university, my granddaughter, she went into, uh, she became a social worker to mix, you know, with children and families and not to do admin work. <coughs> and if that's changed, that's when they get a bit grumpy. I would. <laughs> uh, but if that's being looked at, that's great. Poiser. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a question on the headline figure of the um, 202 established posts. Uh, we've been talking a lot around um, outsourcing of those uh, posts or whether they're a, a, a good for employees, um, but also what proportion of those are part-time in their provision. And we've, we've been looking at and talking around lifestyle and um, work pressures and uh, and the job can be at times, I imagine, quite overbearing. Um, the complex cases that are, are handled by these social workers and they do an enormous great work. Um, <coughs> are we looking at perhaps providing more part-time staff in that provision so people can do work-life balance? Is, is that something we're looking at in terms of a package and the way we present our services? If, if, are we, have we looked at that in some way? Thank you. Yes, I think one one of the of the five priorities, one of them is really around workforce um, conditions, and some of that is around fortifying and advancing our flexible working options in a variety of different ways, <coughs> both in terms of collectively of the workforce and also in terms of the individual level. And 
um, just in discussions recently um, around um, really needing to um, recognise and work at the very individual level with um, staff around their individual needs. Um, it is something that's worked well for us during the pandemic. It's part, part of the learning that I think we've drawn from it in terms of there are other ways that we can do work. Um, so some of those are in pilot form and some of those will absolutely be outlined as part of the st strategy and action plan. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it's the sort of people who are attracted to the profession as well, aren't they? Caring individuals who really value time with their own families as well. Um, and I know some people in the profession that have taken the opportunity to sort of step back, as you've outlined in some of your presentations today, <coughs> to get that balance right as well, to carry on in their profession and, and deliver quality care, um, but at the same time, um, get things right at home for them. So whether we as an authority can offer that here, and I think you've partly answered that question, but I think it's absolutely fundamental, I think, for this, this service, really, given the types of individuals attracted to the, that sort of this career. Thank you. Councillor Salmon. Uh, thank you, Jen. I'll keep it quick. Um, talking about recruiting new people to the, the sector, and uh, you mentioned in your report about 12 coming from overseas, do we have any figures at all if they're coming from care sectors within their own sort of countries? Um, and UK recruits as well, are these majority from the care sector or is it people looking for new opportunities? I'm just thinking about training and language and that sort of thing. So one of the reasons that we've been thinking about international uh, recruitment is precisely because we want to recruit experienced social workers. So one of our, our streams of work is to grow our own in terms of growing people who might be family support workers or in other professions and wanting to really encourage them to think about a career in social work. That takes a bit longer in order to support them through training. What we really need are experienced social workers joining us. Many have joined up with the social work recruitment agencies and that's where a lot of that workforce are. So the, um, the overseas recruitment is absolutely requiring experience and requiring relevant experience. And then we will support those colleagues to transition both culturally and in terms of our legal and statutory frameworks in order to work in this country. And we're working with a recruitment agency in order to make sure they get all of that really important support. Some of us have undertaken international recruitment over many years at different times in social work. And what we've learned is that you must provide those colleagues with the support to be able to make that change. That's, it's a significant transition for them. But we've got colleagues in Plymouth uh, from a, a previous round of international recruitment, it must be 10 years ago, maybe more, they're still with us. You know, it, once, once they land and you can really support them, it can really make a difference to the workforce and bring a diversity that I think can be really valuable. Thank you. So um, we're going to move on now to the last, the last bit uh, relating to Josh McAllister's uh, report around the five missions. I wonder if this is not to take away from the importance of what's here, but this is covered in other arenas, corporate parenting, etc. So um, I want who's who's leading this bit, Jane. If you don't mind keeping it brief, and we move to questions quite quickly, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, understood. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Goes well to <laughs> Thanks, <coughs> just get the, um, thank you. Um, so yeah, so turning to the recommendations around children in care and care experience young people then. Um, today we've uh, sort of narrowed the focus to the five missions that are set out in the review. There is obviously a much wider context to these five missions um, set over two of the um, key elements, the transforming care and care experience parts of the review findings. Um, so, uh, essentially, the five missions are linked to uh, the five foundations um, that, that are uh, highly relevant in terms of determining life outcomes um, for young people. Thanks, Karen. Um, they are ambitious and optimistic um, in terms of their um, reach and aspiration, um, and uh, we really welcome that because we are an incredibly ambitious and aspirational local authority. Um, we've had some um, useful and helpful steer and feedback recently in terms of our um, care experienced um, services from the DFE advisor, um, Mark Waddell, um, who has indicated um, that we're in a good position to get to being a great service and great city for care experienced young people. Um, and I won't repeat, as you say, um, Councillor Lang, the, um, much of what has happened through the 
corporate parenting group um, already about that work. So we welcome the challenge of the five missions. Um, and uh, we know we still have a lot more to do um, as corporate parents and across the partnership stakeholders in the city for our care experience young people. Um, if Jean used the term relentlessly focused, I think Sharon's used it as well. I don't make any apologies to using it again. I think we are relentlessly focused um, uh, on our duties and responsibilities to these young people. So um, out of the following slides, then, I will just pick out um, a couple of um, key points. That's all. Um, so of these five, um, and there's much more I could say about this area of work. So one of the key strategic partnerships we have in the city is with Bernardo's Care Journeys Partnership. Um, and that's really helping us to work in a much more creative way, young person led um, um, innovation. Uh, and you see some of them described there. And um, these are really centered on tackling isolation and loneliness for um, young people in our city and really attends to that first um, mission, therefore. And there's a range of services that sit um, beneath that umbrella of links. Thanks, Karen. Um, Apologies for the detail-heavy slides. There's a few detail-heavy slides, quite a lot to get into um, five. But um, again, we, we're in an improving trajectory in terms of um, care leavers entering higher education and at university and masters. And some of those, and again, I think this is a great mark of a city that is and a local authority that's serious about its um, relationship to care experience young people. So some of those young people are, in fact, slightly out of our age range responsibility. <clears throat> but going back to that lifelong relationship that we're aspiring to, we want to go further than just our statutory duties for these young people. So uh, that includes support um, sometimes beyond that statutory age range. There's some lovely uh, detail there, which I know Sha Karen would love to speak to in a little bit. But we're not going to, Karen. Um, go on, thank you. Next one. Um, so this is a really important um, um, part of our focus for this year um, and I hope uh, some of you will be already aware of and you certainly will be increasingly aware of over the coming weeks and months um, our whole council approach. Um, so this is really um, an approach that yes um, integrates <coughs> and um, invites commitment across our directorates and council to offer up opportunities and offers for care experienced young people um, to engage with really important component of our work around education, employment and training as well. Um, and we've also got aspirations to take that much wider. So there will be much more communication to elected members over the coming months. I know it's, it's something that you're very passionate about and also, and also Councillor Lang um, uh, um, as key uh, members and lead members. Um, so, uh, we want to take that out to our city and our communities and to really make this um, a whole initiative for Plymouth. Thanks, Karen. Um, the, the, the homelessness um, um, position that we find ourselves in as a city is, is well understood by everyone. And of course, within that, um, our vulnerable young people, including but not limited to our care experienced young people, are significantly affected by that. So again, it's a really a strategic imperative for us um, that we deliver what's needed in that space for young people and um, of course you would expect it to feature in the independent review priorities and um, as it does. Thanks Karen. Um, so this last last slide um, is a nice opportunity for us to, to um, <coughs> just highlight a couple of the again um, beyond our statutory duties kind of thinking that we're doing as a city and as local authority. So um, for an example, um, we've launched Ask Jan this year, which is a membership, it says uh, for any Kelly age 18 to 25, and it does extend beyond that. And it's a tremendously important extension of our statutory duties that gives young people access uh, 24 hours to a range of support services, including counselling, free at the point of access for them as care experienced young people in our city. Um, and that's just the starting point for us, but um, we've really responded to what young people have said to us in the care experience groups uh, through our participation teams in some of these key areas. And so again, we see in the um, review really strong alignment with the journey that we're already on in Plymouth um, and the challenge of the missions here. Thanks, Karen. That's all I have for you. Thank you. Thanks. And. Um, when you refer to the detail of the slide, I can assure you that the um, the achievements of those young people were talked about and celebrated in the corporate parenting group. 
Um, so, questions? I've just got a question about the um, I've just got a question about the guarantor um, <coughs> scheme that you're exploring. Is that is that Marianne Hodd's guarantor scheme that you're? Yeah, okay. Because I think that would be interesting to have an update on thinking around that because that is obviously a really significant barrier to to our young people if they're going into private rented. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, it is. It, it forms part of Mark Riddell's recommendations to us. It's also in the review, and it's also part already of our uh, one of our top three really priorities for um, addressing. Um, risk of homelessness and homelessness. Thank you. Councillor Cree. Sorry, me again. Um, um, five, number five, looking at increasing the life expectancy. Have we have you got any thoughts about how that's going to be properly monitored for success at you know short, medium, and long term intervals? Because obviously that's a, a hugely important thing that we need to be looking at. Um, so short, short, medium, and long term. So dealing with sort of short and medium. So the the forums by which and the mechanisms by which we really monitor um, this work are, are twofold. So at the operational level, we have a, a multi agency um, wide partnership, um, corporate parenting operational managers group, um, and um, that is a well attended, extremely um, active engine room for progress. Um, we have an action plan um, that sits behind our strategy, and that's really where the work is progressed. Um, and in terms of governance, of course, reporting to the corporate parenting group uh, in terms of scrutiny and oversight of that work and progress. Um, so that's the short, medium, and I think the longer term, some of our measures in the city, including our um, joint strategic needs assessment around health and our wider partnership and board, do do that reporting for us. It is visible data for us. Thank you. Thank you. So, there's no other questions. Um, just recap. So, we're going to write a letter um, to Kelly Tolhurst. You mentioned the new recruitment and retention strategy, Sharon. So, I wonder if that could be circulated to us when it's out, and maybe we'll consider it in our February scrutiny. Have a look at that. Um, and if there are any social workers thinking of moving to Plymouth watching this, it's a brilliant place to come. Um, and a huge thank you to all the social workers that we have. Um, so we're just going to take a five minute break. I know we're a bit over time. I'm going to rev it up after we've had a, 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 I don't know, if we come back at five two, so you can have a quick comfort break and then cover all this stuff left on the agenda, but we will do it. Thank you. Are we on? Ready to go? Okay, lovely. Thank you very much, everybody. So we're moving on to item eight, the risk monitoring report. And I'm going to hand over to Ross. He must be online, is he? Yes. Oh, I am chair. Thank you. Uh, chair, uh, hand over uh, to you, yeah. Chair, apologies. I know you've, uh, you've heard this now about three or four times over the course of the last week. Um, so um, the reason this item is uh, before you, uh, committee, is uh, following a recommendation from the Audit and Governance Committee to look further at some of the uh, risks identified on the Strategic Risk Register. Um, it seems sensible that uh, scrutiny uh, do some of the, the heavy lifting in this area, and I think it's fair to say, having just um, sat through some of the presentations you've had today, it, it feels to me that you're very much covering some of these elements anyway. Um, so. What you have in front of you is a, an update on the strategic risk register pertinent to the committee. It is now a couple of months out of date and we're currently updating the strategic risk register and just challenging some of the scores we're looking at at the moment. Uh, so my expectation is in the next cycle, you'll have a, a much uh, more up-to-date uh, risk register in front of you. 
Uh, so currently, one strategic risk detailed, uh, risk detailed in this report con uh, concerning the continuing high level of demand on children's social care, with two amber risks concerning school improvement and the fulfilment of our statutory duties, and a risk which is currently rated green uh, concerning early intervention and prevention. Now, the recommendations on the report are to note the current position uh, and be aware that there will be a new position uh, very shortly uh, and consider whether any of these risks should be included on your work program going forward. Um, that's it, I think, by way of introduction, Chair, so happy to um, field any questions uh, as, as well as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Um, at the Performance Finance and Customer Focus um, scrutiny, which I happened to be subbing on earlier this week, um, we discussed their request for a deep dive into children's services finance, uh, which hasn't happened yet. So um, when that um, materialises, then that would be something to go on our work programme, certainly. Um, questions on this? Councillor Poyser. Thank you, Chair. Uh, only in relation to um, item uh, the risk item two on here, I think it is, which is around failure to meet statutory duties for growing volume of capacity of demand for children. Um, financial risk in that, I know since October 2001 to May, obviously where we are now, that's remained at uh, a risk score of 20. It's been fairly consistent. Um, it's a financial risk. Has the, the finances um, and that financial risk remained static or has it changed during that period? And maybe going forward, could we see changes if there is a financial risk what that, that risk is then we can focus in a bit more on it and how that's changing yeah i think we'll have have some of the detail at the later item this afternoon i think okay. it's we monitor it each and every month um as we've just outlined um the sufficiency challenges the main pressure will be in our placements budget around sufficiency challenge we did see an increase in children in care as outlined earlier we are working really hard through our strategic focus in terms of early help, early intervention and, and supporting and keeping our children in their families, in their communities. Um, we can go in a bit more detail on the financial item, but it, it is a constant focus for us in terms of managing our pressures. Supplemented a, a little around the agency pressure that we have around the permanent workforce. So it's an absolute focus and we are, again, in a very similar profile to most children's services in the country around demand pressures. No, thank you, Ross. So um, it's that deep dive that was requested by um, Council Pemberley's um, <coughs> scrutiny committee that we would like to, to have come here when it's done, because um, I think that will shine a light on a lot of the financial pressures for us. But we are going to talk about that in a minute anyway. So, OK, thank you. So now we're going to move on to the um, financial monitoring report. Um, so I'm going to hand over to, uh, sorry, uh, I, can I advise members of the committee that month five was pu published on Wednesday for the committee's consideration and I'm going to invite Helen Slater and Louise Jenkins to present the report to members. Thank you. Are they both online? Hi, uh, uh, my name's Louise and Helen's with me. Uh, we've been asked to uh, go through the finance figures with you. Um, I know you've got called, um, month four and month five. We're planning on going through month five because that's the most recent information. So if you can look at month five. Uh, the overall position for the council is showing an adverse variation of 6.656 million at month five. Uh, but this includes six million of non-controllable costs, including fuel and pay. Um, the monitoring report does detail a recovery plan, which is being worked on at various areas which we're reviewing at the moment. Just homing in on to children's services, the gross pressure at month five is 3.843 million. However, there are mitigations of 1.915 million to leave a net pressure of 1.928 million at month five. Now that pressure is due to a number of reasons, but it's mainly 1.4 million for the increased demand for high cost placements for children with very complex needs and disabilities. There's also an adverse variation of 634 pounds, uh, sorry, um, 
8,000 within home to school transport, where we're witnessing the cost of securing taxi drivers and minibus drivers um, and routes are increasing on average by about 12%, but some routes are going up as much as 50%. Um, there's also an adverse variation of 370,000 within the short break service. And we've been witnessing uh, additional pressures in this area due to the additional need and volume of children accessing that service. Um, I believe there's also additional costs within LEGO and specialist assessments uh, within the children's team. Um, looking at the delivery plans, uh, children's have a delivery plan target of 3.942 million. Uh, the, the majority of that savings target is either they've either been achieved or are on track to be achieved. And Appendix A does give a breakdown of all of that information. Um, but myself and Helen are happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. So have I got, Sharon, did you want to say anything before we go to questions? Just to acknowledge that the areas that we've got the pressures in are statutory services and they are demand led. Um, and, and the transport one is a significant one and, and very much like the pressures from the place directorate it's around the cost of fuel and and that is off and, and the local provider market um, again uh, since I've joined in March we've uh, June sorry we've absolutely each and every month looked at what we can do to control the, the areas of spend we, we as a team um, Jean Ming and others have worked very hard where we can make those budget savings to make them and, and again I think our progress in that shows our commitment to do that where we can However, um, it is the case, and I'm sure you're aware that um, due to the complex needs of our children, that if we do need to secure the right placement for them, that we have to do that. And that placement can come at a significant cost. Um, and, and you only need any point in time, one or two of those, to have a very um, significant impact on your budget. That being said, we each and every month look at our children uh, in care. We look at our throughput in terms of activity. <coughs> And where we can do the right thing to bring um, to reunify our children back home, we do that and have done that very successfully through the programme work of, of Jean and the team. And that's not about money, actually. That's about it's the right thing for that young person to get back home. So we will continue to do that. We working through Emma, as described earlier, really looking at how we develop our fostering service to reduce the, co the differential, differential between residential and fostering is quite significant. So we will continue that focus. It's the right thing for our children. Um, but obviously there will be situations where it's the right and appropriate thing to do and that may have a negative budget impact. We know them all, we look at them all and we care for our children and make the right decisions. Thank you. Um, do we know, um, so when you talk about some of the very high cost placements for young people who have some very complex physical needs, are we satisfied that our colleagues in the, CC, the ICS um, are contributing as much as they should be and what what conversations are we having about that because that that could help us if yep. if that that cost is being shared fairly so in the mit mitigating actions there's a half a million pounds for um, contribution from health for that case furthermore again um, work with Jean and the team for every um, new entrance or care package if it's an amendment to a care package we have a panel where we look at the care element the health element and we will absolutely have those um, respectful challenges with our health colleagues where we need to to make sure we get that, that contribution in place. A little bit like our earlier conversation, um, for some of our um, children in, in care, it might be that their care package breaks down. So again, we're looking at the learning around that. What could have we done differently? How might we prevent that? Particularly in the area of short breaks, that's often an area where we have increasing demand and we know that our foster carers and carers and parents really, really benefit from that. So we need to look at what we can do through our fostering service to make sure breaks more available to better support, better increase. Um, but yes, absolutely looking towards health. Councillor Brasdale. Thank you. I um, completely appreciate what you're saying about the high level of need of, of some of these individuals. Um, but just so that the committee can get a, a sense of um, where that money's going towards. Um, so the, the children um, that have £20,000 a week um, worth of care, if over a year that's £1 million per child, um, would it be possible as part of the deep dive for the committee to get a breakdown of um, 
where that figure is, is broken down on in terms of staff costs and other things, just so we can start to understand um, how that's spent. <coughs> Yeah, we should be able to pull that together for you. No problem. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Councillor Burson. Yeah, just as a follow-up link to that, um, I'll just this might be better to answer from um, Councillor Carlisle, just because it's a one about political direction, um, based on you know some of the, the large figures associated with with some of this. So just wondering what consideration um, or feasibility reports you know might be done about um, whether any of these services are better done in-house as opposed to private providers. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's something that can be looked into to see if there's maybe a different report. As you say, I'm sure this one of them must have one knocking around, really, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. There is one. That's, uh, there is one. Can you send one across? Yeah, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Yeah. Is that okay? We can do that. Thank you. Councillor Harrison. Thank you. It's only just a, um, a quick one. It relates to the homes, uh, homes to school transport. Uh, obviously, you spoke before about the fact that there's a number of, of children that may have to be educated outside of the city boundary. So is, 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 um, is there a significant amount of money that's going on transport because of children that are being uh, schooled elsewhere and then coming in? Or is it purely just obviously the economics at the moment? Of, of the, it, the numbers um, <clears throat> have remained fairly static. Um, so it's not a volume increase per se, it's more around the cost of energy and the, the differential in the market with some providers handing the contract back and price going up. So in, in terms of demand, it is fairly static. And one of the pieces of work that we've got looking on is looking at the overall sufficiency in our special school estate and looking at, there's, there's, I suppose there's two cohorts, there's our children in care, but there's also our children in homes, that are in, our, in their family homes, travelling out of the city for specialist education. So we have a sufficiency piece of work looking at that and thinking about what the future is, the future demand. Um, so, at the, But at the moment, the acute pressure is more around the cost rather than the volume increasing. Thank you. I mean, I know <coughs> at uh, the scrutiny on Tuesday, our finance lead, Councillor Lowry, you know, was really getting concerned about this. We keep putting more money into children's services. The demand is going up. And I think it goes back to the letter that we're going to write that there are obviously things that we can do locally, but there's also the national picture and we need a national recognition that this is a serious problem when it comes to local authority finances, which have been cut so significantly, yet the demand is going up and we absolutely must care properly for these young people, but it can't be dragging us financially over a cliff. And that's sort of what it feels like year on year. Um, just to just just I want to say that because I think it's worrying and I think Josh McAllister's got it. Um, we need to make sure that um, that nationally that message is, is getting through to the people who can who can do something about the finances that we need to keep caring properly for our young people. Can I just can I just come back yeah. again? Sorry. Yeah. Just to reassure, one of the things that I did uh, for my second month was do a complete financial analysis of our budget against our statistical neighbours, our southwest neighbours, and England local authorities that are good or outstanding to see where we are high spending children's services relatively. There's national data that takes you from all of the education services and their nuances all the way through to social care and care legal service. The majority of that review demonstrated that Plymouth is a low spending or medium spending local authority. We are not a local authority that is commissioning and spending, you know, out of kilter amounts of money. So I think it's really important to note that. So whilst we talk about more money going in, when we look line by line, and I can promise you I looked at every line, we were either at the low end or the medium end. Um, and I think it's just important that we note that in the context of our relative position. It's not, it's not a, I'm not making a point saying we're overspending in any way. I'm saying we're underfunded for what we need to provide and the proportion of our budget, which year on year is is getting smaller. Uh, Councillor Croswell. I was going to come back up on that because um, in the same way that we're going to write uh, to uh, regarding uh, the Josh McAllister review, is this also something that we should actually be stressing as well? Because, you know, there's about to be a uh, national government settlement. We don't know what that situation is going to be. There could actually be less funding in terms of not taking into account the issue of inflation and perhaps this is something we should also be uh, putting our case forward 
afterwards as well. I'm asking both the, the chair about that and also about um, asking Councillor Carlisle about that as well. Okay, no, I mean, we can add, you know, we can emphasise that in our letter to the Minister and whether we expand it to who's the education, uh, Kit, Kit Malthouse. Kit Malthouse. Yes, yeah. I, I think also as well, especially considering um, what um, Sharon has just said. Uh, about the fact that we are, you know, to the middle, low end, so we are an authority which uh, actually looks after and cares for public funds very, very um, admirably, and we are making a case, and we are an authority which acts very responsibly, and that should also add, I think, to our um, representation. Thank you. So, no other questions on this item? Um, so... Thank you very much, Helen and Louise. Uh, now we're going to move on to item 10, which is the performance scorecard. And I'm handing over to Councillor Carlisle, who is going to introduce this item. And then Sharon Jean Ming and Paul are going to talk to the uh, performance scorecard. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. As you can see, the posse's all turned up next to me here, haven't they? Uh, so with the performance scorecard, this regular report focuses on key area performances across children's services and covering issues for children receiving a social work service and education. With uh, Paul Stevens, Jean Kelly, Ming Fan and Sharon Muldoon will summarise key messages and respond to any questions that the committee may have. Hello, uh, my name is Paul Stevens. I'm one of the performance advisors for the Chief Exec's Department um, and I support Jean's service. My colleague Hannah supports Ming's service, the other side being the EPS side. Um, so this report is trying to give you um, quite a high level view of some of the key indicators. We've got a lot of reporting um, and we could drown you in data, but what we're trying to do here is something that's you know, a high level view um, where you can digest the information and give you a, a summary of some of the direction of travel and things like the caseloads and number of children in care, that sort of thing. Um, we were talking about performance earlier. Um, one of the things to... Um, I think recognises we did move from one system to a new system um, only four months ago. We're um, revisiting a lot of our reporting to make sure it can use the new system. We've prioritised a lot of the reporting for um, you know, statutory reporting, um, but we do have some small bits that we're still working on, uh, things like the, the, the working out automatically the distance from address A to B. What we're focusing on is that we can report how many children we've got on care, where they are, um, any issues, that sort of, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, I know you've had the report for a while, so this is looking at quarter one. Um, quarter two only finished 10, 11 working days ago, so we haven't got that at the minute, and it wouldn't be able to get through the QA process quick enough to get to this session. So this is a little bit out of date, um, looking at the end of um, quarter one, which is uh, April through to June excuse me, <coughs> April through to June. Okay. If you have any questions on it, I think you've hopefully had a chance to review some of the information in it. Any questions? Councillor Creswell? I hope I'm on, I'm on the right item because I wanted to ask about the key stage four outcomes, if that's possible. Um, and I just think it might be useful if you can explain a little bit about the Key Stage 4 Average Attainment ACE score, how that's actually uh, calculated and the significance of it might be really helpful, I think, to, to members to understand. Hi, thank you, Councillor. So the Attainment ACE score looks at all of the subjects across the curriculum at Key Stage 4 and provides them with a score. The methodology underneath it is extremely complex we're talking like Einstein level calculations so I can't actually articulate that to you right now um, we can get you a definition if you'd like that but again might want to talk you through to through that at a later date um, any other questions that come out of that sorry that it, it might be useful I think we're going to look at the data uh, at the next at the next meeting and it might be useful to have some sort of like presentation which actually perhaps explains some of those some of those things as part that would run with that data absolutely. i think that would be quite useful absolutely we can schedule that time we can get the officers involved in the same way that we've um, brought some of our team <coughs> along today we can do the same with education colleagues i, I think that would be really useful yeah. uh, what we can also do is maybe add that as a supplement in part of the report so that's always something to reference 
Thank you. Um, can I don't know if it's Sharon or Jean, just talk me through the work around um, the figures on children on a repeat plan. So our analysis of that information, because it's a, a percentage that is, it, it's relatively high. So this is children who've previously been on a child protection plan and they've returned to, to a child protection plan either within the last 12 months or indeed at some stage in their lifetime. Um, these are often children who are living with neglect, uh, living with issues related to domestic abuse. So those issues can improve and then uh, uh, and change. So we've been working hard to look at how we can support children on one uh, sustainable plan in order to improve outcomes and therefore step them down or out of our service once risk has been reduced and uh, safety has been built. And for some of those children, that can take quite a long time. So that can contribute to children who've been on a plan for over 18 months or two years. What's not helpful is children moving between plans because actually fundamentally the support should be the same. We should really make sure that, that we're supporting children in a consistent way. Now in terms of the data, um, what we've had in the last year and a half is a reducing number of overall children on child protection plans, but no change in the percentage of children coming, or the, sorry, no, percent, no change in the number of children coming back onto plans. So that's, that's given us a, a higher percentage than uh, we would want. So if you like, the, the numbers have gone down, so therefore the percentage looks higher because the number of children coming back onto repeat plans hasn't reduced with the overall number of children on plans reducing. I hope that makes sense. It makes sense in my head. Apologies if it's complicated. I can clarify further if, if you need. But, but that's really easy to say that, well, therefore, we don't have a problem. Well, we do. We, we still experience that as a challenge, that we need to have children on the right plan at the right time and not be preoccupied with a process-driven approach. Well, you know, do we step them up to child protection or do we step them down to ch children in need plans? For families, the fact that there is a plan to safeguard and protect and support is actually the most important thing and we need to get that right consistently over time. So that's the work we're focused on to, to really get this right going forward and we're still in the middle of that work. Can I just add as well, um, because it's sometimes it is statistics, because it's a small cohort, if you have a family that have got a large sibling group it can also kick out the percentages. So in this situation, it really is in the analysis gene, isn't it, where we're really looking family by family to understand and the nuances around it. So it's, but, it, but for your reassurance again, it's an absolute area of focus that, that we look at each and every time. And which, which of these indicators would you say we as a committee can, um, should be honing in on in terms of our improvement journey of what, what will Ofsted grab onto um, so that we, so we can reassure ourselves that our improvement journey is mm. heading in the right direction. Um, they'll always focus on those indicators that are of more concern and the things we're doing really well. So that's just a general rule. I think we all know that. Um, they look at volume and throughput through the system. They look how is the system changing over time. So they will be interested in the fact that we had, as outlined earlier, an increased children care over a very short period of time, quite a large increase. Importantly, though, we can see now that that is stabilising and withholding. They will look across the system, so they'll look at our early help activity because they'll be wanting to understand how vibrant is that and how does it relate to the number of children in need that we see in the system. They will also want to look at the number of referrals into social care, who's referring, why, those referrals that have repeat referrals, were, were, were our thresholds right, did we miss anything, what's our understanding? So from a basket of indicators, it's referrals, child in need, and then some very definite ones around our children in care. Moreover, though, they'll also want to understand our quality assurance. So that's the qualitative part of our processes, not just the scores on the doors, for want of a statement, but how well we know ourselves in terms of the quality of the interventions and the difference that we make and how we make that difference in our children and families' lives. And they'll also finally want to, which is a link to our next one, how well is the partnership across the survey, across the city working? Um, so it's very difficult to pinpoint which ones because it will be unique to each local authority's relative position, but they'll absolutely look at early help, 
referrals, child protection, child in need, and there's a very focused ones around outcomes of children in care, including education, as we discussed earlier. I know that sounds like a really vague answer, but that is that's the reality. No, thank you. I think that's really helpful. Uh, any more questions on your performance scorecard? No. So we. We note, we note that report, and I also say thank you to Hannah. Sorry, I didn't introduce you because you weren't on my list. Um, but thank you, Paul, and thank you, Hannah. And uh, we're going to move on to item 11 now, Plymouth Safeguarding Partnership, and I think Councillor Carlisle is going to introduce this item, and then we'll hand over to Sharon, Jean, and to Carl and John. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Apologies again, Hannah, as well. I thought Ming was still up there, so apologies about that. Um, yes, yeah, so we're on to safeguarding children requires all agencies and organisations to work effectively together <coughs> Sorry, to ensure effective arrangements to coordinate support, information sharing and oversight. It's important that these arrangements are well understood and communicated effectively. The Plymouth Safeguard and Children's Partnership provides the me uh, mechanism for this multi-agency work and the multi-agency safeguarding arrangements are set out in a document to provide transparency for all. Bless you and is saved on the Plymouth Safeguarding Children's Partnership website, if need be. So we have Carl Nill, until recently the Partnership Manager, and now in his new role as Head of Service of Front Door. And we also have John Clements, who I did see up there as well, the Independent Scrutineer for the Partnership. They're going to briefly set out these arrangements for the committee and also answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Can you turn your mic on? Good afternoon. Um, John's going to take us through the first item and then I'm going to take us through the next one, if that's OK. Thank you. Over to you, John. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, good, <clears throat> good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity of speaking to you today. Uh, I'm your independent scrutineer for the partnership uh, and I've been in role since June of this year. Um, working together 9, uh, 2018 is the statutory guidance which outlines um, what areas have got to do in respect of safeguarding children. And it's a very detailed document which outlines a number of statutory requirements in relation to ourselves. Um, as an area, the three statutory leads are the police, the what was the CCG, now the ICB, the Integrated Care Board, and the local authority. And they're defined as statutory safeguarding partners. And they have to come up with a set of arrangements that uh, promote safeguarding um, understand what the local issues are as well as taking cognizance of what's happening nationally and setting uh, a, a working a sort of procedures practices with other local partners to make sure our children are safe since 2019 there's been a requirement for arrangements to be published uh, and we've had those arrangements in place in plymouth uh, and what we've recently done is, is undertaking a review of those safeguarding arrangements to see that we are compliant with the um, the guidance from 2018 and to make sure that we are up to date and working in line with other other sort of um, other local strategies and plans. So a call and myself have recently undertaken that and it's to assure yourselves that um, we are, we feel we are compliant and we've obviously published those arrangements just to reinforce um, what's ha happening currently within Plymouth. Um, in relation to what I've seen, certainly in the last four months as I've been in post, is that we have a very committed leadership and membership towards safeguarding in Plymouth. Uh, there's good representation at leadership level, managerial level and practitioner level. Um, and there is good representation on the range of different groups that we have. We have a, a sort of strategic high level group, which um, Sharon chairs at the moment as the Strategic Systems Leadership Board, which we are part of. And then we have our own partnership board, which I've been chairing currently. Um, for that, we receive really good support and leadership from those key organisations and a number of others, including our health providers, voluntary sector, probation, schools, etc. Uh, we have a really, I think, uh, relevant work plan to Plymouth. Uh, we focus on neglect, child sexual harm, uh, being trauma informed and making sure we get the right support at the right time at the right place. Um, and there is a plan together with sort of backup plans with our subgroups to support the achievement of those objectives. There has been some tinkering recently. We identified that some of the structure wasn't necessarily right. Uh, and we've introduced a new group, which I'm due to start next week, which is designed to um, create a better link between quality assurance and the development of practice. 
uh, and we're hoping that will take us forward over the next 12 months and longer in a more effective way. Um, and we've also just introduced a new quality assurance framework and quality assurance work plan for the year, which gives us a, a better closing the loop opportunity of understanding what's happening locally and making sure that what we are doing uh, suits the needs of our children and we're achieving the outcomes that we're obviously we're striving for. Uh, in my time, I think we've got, a, you know, there's a really positive partnership. Uh, we've got some work to do, but on the whole, I think we're in, a, in a, a reasonably decent place. And I hope to report further in the future about, you know, the, the successes we've had and the outcomes we've been able to achieve. Thank you very much, John. Chair, did you want to add anything? No. So we hand it over to questions. Got any questions? Councillor Fraser. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. That was a really good presentation. Just, um, I suppose, from my perspective, how are we monitoring um, the strategy um, and its effectiveness with um, with a multi agency um, sort of situation as well? How are we? What's uh, how's that going to be reported back? So. Um, in respect, we, we, we've devised our own data set for child safeguarding, but what that has been incorporated into is a, is a wider data set that covers healthy and happy and aspire and achieve. And uh, Sharon is driving this considerably across the, the strategic partnership, trying to make sure we're identifying those, those connections. But within that, what we're focusing on are the key proxy indicators. So, for instance, if you look at the number of children who have repeat child protection plans and the number of children who are subject to re-referrals, albeit that data is derived from the council, it is a clear proxy indicator about how the whole system is working. So that's at one level. What we have behind that within this plan that I've, we've, we've just come up with is a number of audits that will be undertaken at key points through the year. So the first one that we hope to get ratified next week will be looking at child sexual harm. So analysis of a number of cases that will identify what current practice looks like, what outcomes we're achieving for those children. And we're looking to carry further audits, looking at early help, looking at neglect, looking at domestic abuse, all the key topics that we know will give us insight into how effective we are at safeguarding children as a multi-agency partnership. And what we want to do on top of that is a level of thematic review, looking at those priorities um, trying to understand what the bigger issues are. So, for instance, we've got a session plan for the 31st of October, which is looking at child exploitation, and we'll be reviewing how all the agencies contribute towards that, how that interfaces with the adult safety framework, uh, and be able to give us, I suppose, some diagnostics on what's working well and what's not working well, so we can just um, understand what further progress we need to make. So all of that will be transparent, all of that will be reported upon, uh, reported within the partnership, but obviously available to yourselves should we need to come back and report that through to you. Thank you. Is that a follow-up? Um, yes, yeah, so, so does that include kind of speaking with service users, um, employees, um, as a form of kind of audit and review? Does that, ha does that happen on a regular basis? Yeah. Is it kind of, is it monthly, annual? How? how uh, from what I've gathered from sort of some response there, that some of the performance is monitored through the scorecard as well, you were saying maybe? Is that so some of it's council monitored and then? Yeah, kind of, uh, yeah so the, the scorecard's a combination of, of data we gather from health, from police and from yourselves. Um, you provide by far the most because you, you have the, the greatest available data that's relevant to us, but it is a multi-agency data set, so that is monitored. Certainly within the quality insurance work, what we are looking at is involvement with our young safeguarders. We've got a brilliant resource for our safeguarders where they are keen to do some survey or canvassing work for us. And part of it will include surveying families and also surveying our workforce. So there will be case audited work, uh, but that will be reinforced by other uh, sorry, lines of inquiry, which should allow us to triangulate the information we get. So we should get a fairly comprehensive view uh, I can, you know, what we can provide you is with that work plan, if you'd like, and you can see what's intended over the next 12 months and beyond, albeit that may change subject to whatever, you know, issues arise uh, dynamically. Thank you. Councillor Tippett. Oh, oh. Just if I may, just um, to answer your question at the back of the um, 
pack of this item, there's a link to the priorities and plans page of the website. And within that, there's um, a plan on a page for this year. And I think that's helpful because it just sets out what should we see, what should you see, what should the public see over this year that changes as a result of the work we're doing. Because you know, what's different for making for children? That, that's a, a local and national issue at a, at a partnership level of really setting out nice and early on, this is what we think should look different as a result of our interventions this year. Um, and some of that could be the things we've already discussed um, today, such as a reduction in infant child care. Thank you, Sean. I just want to come in on a, on a couple of things, really. Um, one of my challenges as I arrived was that the data set that we had was very focused on children known to social care and the social care processes. And I felt quite strongly, and, and John knows this and was thankfully supportive of it, is we need to be looking across the whole of the system and not just on the social care processes. So how well are our schools as a protective factor, including young people, you know, those that are maybe at the margins of their education, equally thinking about mental health, emotional well-being, what's the role of health, how are they supporting? So I've been quite keen that we stretch the school card whilst we are a safeguarding board to look at how healthy is the overall system, because if we just focus at that top end, we may be missing the things that we need to do to prevent our young people um, needing to be at that, that situation. So I think it's just important to note, so it's safeguarding, but if you think, well, why have we got aspiration around education? Because it's a protective factor, and we know what we want to reduce needs, for example, in our city. It's too high for many of our vulnerable learners. That's one issue. Second issue is whilst we've got a very planned and active and really well um, challenged by John now programme, um, it's incumbent upon me from time to time to look at what, what what do I think is happening in the system and to work with John to alert to. I'm interested to understand more about this. And so the, the programme is quite dynamic. So the review that um, John's just mentioned around exploitation came from just, just some operational discussions I had and I thought, actually, we want to look and see what's going on here. So whilst we do have those set things, absolutely throughout the year, through my engagement with Ming and Jean's team, if I feel there's something we should be looking at, then obviously I'd take that to John and we would amend the plan so that we can be dynamic around that. Thank you. Councillor Tibbetts? Um, I was just wondering if it would be possible to get kind of a rundown of the sort of training that all of the partners get on safeguarding, because it'd be really interesting to see um, how in-depth that training goes and whether it includes things like giving um, members of staff, say, at schools and colleges uh, the information on how to identify, um, I'm trying to think of an example of, say, if a student says, oh, please don't tell my mum something, uh, whether that's just, uh, oh, they don't want their phone taken away from them when they go home from school, or is it actually something more serious that needs to be looked into? It'd be really interesting to see. Thank you. John, did you want to come in? Yeah, I can. <clears throat> I, it, it's really complex, the, the, the training, because the training is done on a number of different levels. So each of our key organisations, be that a primary school or whether that be the Devon and Cornwall Police, will have their own internal levels of safeguarding training. So to, to reassure you in relation to the question you've just asked about the school, uh, there's a document called Keeping Children Safe in Education. And those of you that are governors will be really aware of it uh, because it's refreshed every year. And then there's um, a, a version which is then cascaded through our schools. Um, and that really is the key document. And most schools, to my knowledge, will do a level of safeguarding training at the start of each academic year, reinforcing what the current themes are, but concentrating on some of the perennials, such as the issue you've raised. Uh, beyond that, there will be multi-agency training, which we provide through the partnership, which is concentrating on those who are probably operating in the more um, specialist area where they are likely to turn off at uh, initial child protection conferences or team around the child, team around the family. Uh, and that will take them through working in partnerships or the more complex arrangements around child protection so that they have a really good understanding of that, pa sort of that partnership working. And then beyond that, there will be specialist training. So there are areas such as neglect, child sexual abuse, which you require probably separate nuances and maybe a, a, a Yes, for a bit of a cue, a cue to see what the signs may be or what else you could do. So we'll provide that. And there's a topic we're looking at at the moment, which is called adultification, which goes back. If you look at the child cue situation, which was the black young lady who was inappropriately searched at a school in London a couple of years ago, 
uh, we've come out of that with some attitudinal difficulties and we're looking at a training course called adultification, which challenges uh, practitioners as to whether they are actually seeing the child as a child or have they attributed an age which is not appropriate and not fitting and maybe a little bit prejudiced. So it's a range of different training provided uh, and even within our organisations within health, they'll be providing a range of different service training um, maybe looking at midwifery, maybe looking at paediatric wards, or maybe looking at adult services. So there'll be a, a range across it. It's quite a complex picture. Thank you. Do you want to come back? No? Okay. Um, I wanted to ask a question. Um, before this meeting, a, a colleague and I were saying it's an impressive list of partners that we've got. Is there Are there any obvious gaps on there, you think? Is there anybody you would like to be part of it who isn't yet? You don't have to name names, but is there anybody who you approached who didn't want to be? Um, or are there any barriers to any particular organisations being part of this? And I've got a second question just around members in general, members who aren't on this committee. How, or whether you think you need to, how will you disseminate the work that you're doing to, to um, members in terms of we're saying safeguarding is everybody's business? Um, just how you communicate the messages from the safeguarding partnership to people who aren't on this committee. Thank you. Okay. Um, from my take on it, and I'm, I'm not, what, you know, 100% on a cross plan, so there may be some of the voluntary sectors that I'm not aware of, but in terms of our key partners, we have got them all on board. So certainly we have the key statutory partners, the three that I mentioned, and then the ones after that would be the health providers such as Live, Live Well, um, University Hospitals Plymouth, Probation Service are an, another key um, member. And then we have good representation from the NSPCC and Bernardo's as voluntary community sector members. So we've got good membership in terms of that being cascaded. The responsibility of all of those key organisations is to take back to their own particular body and make sure the key messages are being passed through. It gets a little more difficult with um, education because it's diverse, it's extensive, and it is it is not sort of hierarchical. Uh, but we have a specific safeguarding in education reference group we which we use to pass messages through, and they have a representative that attends the partnership board, who in turn then can communicate the key messages from that back to that forum. There's always a difficulty with the voluntary sector being so diverse, but we've got, obviously, you know, as I said, membership on the partnership, which enables that um, that voice and those comments to go back through. Um, beyond that, I think at the moment we're, we're, we're pretty secure and on our subgroups, we have appropriate membership for all of those subgroups. And we, we have the opportunity where we have a group, if we need to bring somebody who's not a standing member, to bring somebody into our, um, that expertise or that insight. Um, so we do have that degree of flexibility, even if we, we do have a, a sort of set list of um, attendees. Right. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's just that I can't see any church organisers, any religious organisations on here. Is there a reason for that? Um, to be honest, I, I can't I can answer that. that that's not unusual. Um, there will be links through to the faith community, but whether they're on the, the, the partnership is a, a different matter. But um, we will be connected through to local faith groups, local safeguarding leads within the faith community. Um, but to be honest, I, I, I'm not sure exactly the reason why we don't have it. I know some agents, uh, some partnerships um, have decided that they have just you know, kept a, a small group and that's not included the faith ones. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know enough around the um, faith groups. It might be something we we explore and just understand the history around that. In in terms of the member issue, um, certainly where I've worked before, we can we we have delivered sessions as a children's services and corporate parenting, etc. Safeguarding. So I'm not sure again whether we do that in Plymouth, but it is certainly something that we could put together and, and support members on if they wanted that. Thank you. Um, I'd be interested, actually, maybe as a recommendation, just to explore the um, whether an offer has an invitation has been extended to our faith groups in the city, or 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 to come back to us to understand why that's not necessary. But that just seems like one kind of glaring omission to me. I don't know what other people think of that. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah, certainly in terms, I, I was talking about members specifically in terms of the safeguarding partnership. We do do safeguarding training, corporate parenting training, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, we don't want to overload new members or even, you know, longer, longer standing members. But I do think it's important if this work is going to, well, it does work. I'm not saying it doesn't work. But I just think we should be sharing it as widely as possible. Um, so it might be something to look into about how it can be shared wider than this committee, if people agree with that. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything, John. Are there any more questions? No? Okay, can we take that as a recommendation then, Jake, that that's, that's looked at and fed back to us as committee members, if everybody's happy with that? Thank you very much, John. And um, I wondered if maybe you could come back to the last... Oh, it's gone <laughs> through you then, Sharon. Uh, he's back. Sorry, John. Uh, whether you could come back at the last scrutiny um, of this municipal year to talk about how your plan's working and the difference that you're making. And I wondered too if, I mean, this might be an ask too much, but it's an ask in any event, whether maybe um, you could be accompanied by a couple of the young safeguarders maybe at that scrutiny, scrutiny committee if they would be prepared to come and talk to us about what they do, if that's something that could be explored for us. Yes, certainly. I'd love to come back, actually. It's always great to come to these meetings. So, yeah, that's an absolute definite from myself. Um, in relation to the children, yeah, we will the young safe goddess, we'll, we'll, we'll ask them. And uh, based on experience, they are really keen to um, have these experiences. I I'm, I'm really want to tell key people in Plymouth what their experiences are and what their thoughts are. So we'll get on to that. We'll, we'll make those inquiries, but I would be quite confident knowing that. Lovely. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say that it might mean that that scrutiny committee might need to be after school hours, but we will explore the invitation first and then we've got enough time to arrange that if everybody agrees. All right, thank you very much. So now we're moving on to item 12. Um, Councillor Carlisle, you're going to introduce this uh, item about the national review into the murders of Arthur Labinio Hughes and Star Hobson. And can I advise members in the room and for members of the public watching that viewer discretion is advised uh, for this item because some people may find some of the content upsetting. So I'm going to hand over to Councillor Carlisle. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, during 2020, tragically, two children died in Bradford and Solihull. So, you know, the National Panel agreed to undertake a national review in order to support national learning as the issues are relevant for all local authorities as part of their responsibilities to safeguard children. We have Carl and John are going to highlight the key issues from this report for us and the action being taken locally in Plymouth to ensure the learning is being embedded across our city. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Welcome. Thank you. So um, I've only got three slides, you'll be pleased to know, and I, I won't go into great detail as that's provided within the pack. Um, <coughs> but it's just to say a, a few things about what the review said. Um, some of these are recurring themes that have come up for many years in many different reports into social care and social work, and, and they're not new. I think what is new is the, the way it's been framed and the um, what, what's being positioned as a opportunity to really change the way we do things around protecting children across England. Um, the review talked about information sharing between agencies being an issue around um, uh, social care and health colleagues not always sharing concerns between them, um, nobody really having the full picture of concerns for a particular child, um, a lack of robust critical thinking and challenge within and between agencies, so where agencies are not maybe agreeing with um, the decision of another agency, where is that challenged, where is that recorded, where is that followed up if it's still left unhappy? <laughs> um, the triggering of some of the statutory child protection processes not happening at the right time. Um, and the workforce not, not always having the right skills and experience to undertake what's quite specialist child protection work. Challenges around working with reluctant parents, um, are we being as creative at times as we could be? And I say we as the, the wider workforce across England, because this report refers to us. Um, are, are, we, are we being creative about how we, we work with parents that are reluctant? Um, bearing in mind that it's understandable that lots of parents are reluctant to work with social workers. Um, not understanding always the lived experience of children um, and a really poor understanding at times of domestic abuse. And then within all of that, um, are, are the right organisational conditions being created? 
explore that complex job section by doing a test case. So um, we've already started um, making changes to Plymouth over the last 12 months um, that impact directly on the recommendations of this report. So I was just going to highlight some of those and then let's have a look at some of the really national guidance and national legislat legislative change um, to, to make happen. So as John alluded to earlier, education involvement in the work of the partnership um, wasn't, wasn't quite where it needed to be. And we've put a lot of work into really involving education colleagues from across Plymouth in a, a much more helpful way. Um, reframing the education reference group to be focused around safeguarding, reinforcing the membership of the, the right people at the right strategic level so that we can really make a difference to how schools, colleges, early years settings um, and other education settings are engaged with the work of safeguarding in the city. Um, there's a, an absolute commitment um, within the, the city council and across the wider partnership that actually when we engage with education colleagues and get that right, it immediately improves the likelihood of success of safeguarding our young children as well. And that there's a really strong correlation between those children um, where the education isn't quite right for them and where there are safeguarding concerns. Um, and we've got a real buy-in from education partners across the city to, to improve um, how we work together to earn that. Another one of the things, and it was already mentioned, is the data. So the data scorecards have been updated um, to the partnership, bringing more multi-agency data and really think about what it is that we want to see change over the year. What's going to tell us that we, we're making a good progress for children and families across Plymouth? Um, a MASH oversight. So one of the key recommendations in this report from the National Panel was that um, multi-agency safeguarding hubs in both authorities didn't quite have the right oversight and data that it needed to. And um, we've put arrangements in place to change that in Plymouth. So going forward, the multi-agency safeguarding hubs um, will report into safeguarding partnerships so that there's that oversight and scrutiny on a quarterly basis around what's going on, what difference is being made for children and families, and really owning it as a partnership. Um, because actually what, what goes into the multi-agency safeguarding hub is a partnership issue. Um, and it, it tells us the health of the partnership as to whether we're getting that right and the right things are going on at the right time. And then an assurance plan. So um, we, we felt following this report that there were a number of issues that we just wanted assurance on. Is this an issue for us here in Plymouth? If it's not, great. Where's the evidence to show that it's not? Or if it is, what do we need to put in place to rectify that so that children and families in Plymouth are not experiencing same as what's, what's been found elsewhere. That assurance plan has been put in place um, and there's a, there was a meeting in September to review that and there's a further meeting I believe next week to make sure that we've made a fast pace of change around some of the things that need to be changed in the wider partnership. Thanks Karen. Thank you. So there were a few other things that we think we need a government response on um, just to if we're, if we're going to take up the national panel recommendation. So the new multi-agency child protection teams, um, that's a really good idea. It would follow on neatly from the multi-agency safeguarding hub that we have, um, but we, we would need legislative change and the resourcing to make that happen. Um, that's not just about the resourcing of the city council, that's about the resourcing of partner agencies as well. Um, and it, it's a fundamentally different way of doing things that may well lead to improved outcomes, but we need, we need that buy-in um, on a, a national level to make that happen. This talk about having a new framework and practice standards for child protection, again, that requires a national national change. Um, consistency of the multi-agency safeguarding hubs across the country. We're already looking at how ours works in Plymouth, learning from best practice, particularly looking at what we can learn from authorities that have recently been graded as outstanding, and that have got a really good relationship-based approach to how they work with um, partners and with children and families. So we're confident that we're doing what we can to improve that, but there's probably more to do at a national level to make sure that's more consistent. Looking at the structure of safeguarding partnerships, again, that's a national issue, but what we have done, as John outlined earlier, is to restructure our partnership just to make sure we're doing the best we can within the current guidance and framework. Um, and there's a suggestion that partnership working should be the focus of inspections going forward. Um, we're confident that if that does become a focus of inspection, we have a good news story to tell about how we've 
adapt with what we're doing in this month's event to improve the partnership work that we have at Plymouth. Um, there's also talk about having a National Child Protection Board and a National Panel role in driving practice improvements about how we use data and around sort of you know what support and focus for the London Act to produce. Um, those last two points are things that we're already doing about here in Plymouth as much as we can. Um, there's a much more focus on data over the last few months than there ever has been before um, and making sure that that helps us understand what's going on and, and what questions we need to ask. Um, and domestic abuse, a significant amount of the children that we're working with are early help, child protection, child and youth, domestic abuse is a feature. We know that there's more work to do there um, and there's a real commitment across the partnership that that needs a joined up approach to getting that right. Um, and I think that might have been the last slide. So I'm happy to take yeah. questions. Thank you very much, Clark and Sue. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Does Sharon or Jean want to come in or we'll just go over to questions then, could we? So we've got Councillor Poyser and then Councillor Cresswell. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Carl. That was a really good presentation. Um, clearly, we've we've moved on from the tragic set of events that's happened. We've we've learned quite a bit, so we've got systems in place. Um, just want to get a bit of a feel for kind of the work culture and whether people. One of the items was on there about critical thinking and, and challenge, and people were able to speak up. Um, not only when things go wrong, but talk about service provision and maybe changing the way we do things. Do you feel as if we've got that culture within within the council and with our partners that we can challenge each other? Where do you think we are with that? So I think that's a, a really helpful point. So we, we introduced a refreshed case resolution protocol um, in the partnership over the last few months um, to address that because um, we, we think that there are times that that challenge and critical mm -hmm. scrutiny of decisions does happen but isn't recorded quite as robustly as it could be. Um, and we think there are times that people just need to be given permission more to, to say, if you're not feeling sure that a child is, is safe, if you're not feeling sure that decision is right, raise that. Um, so we've put a really clear mechanism in place. It's available on the partnership website. It's been widely distributed across the partnership. Um, but the fact that we've done that would, would say that we, we recognise we have more to do to get that right across the system. Shame. So I think it's really important in that again in that systems leadership place so in my role that I sort of role model and, and be open so I attended a head teachers conference two weeks ago I think it was about 200 heads and deputy heads same co's there and I talked about we know we haven't got all of it right yet and the only way we're going to make it better and get to the place where it is better is if we have that honest dialogue. We use the escalation process and dispute processes in place, but also that you talk to me and talk to us as a management team. And since since that, I've had two or three, you know, so I do it responsibly, obviously. I don't need my e email being full every day. But since that, two or three have come through from heads that just, you know, sharing a child's experience where maybe the system hasn't been quite right. And they are absolutely being fed into the team um, to say, let's have a look at this, let's understand. And I suppose that's the spirit of partnership we need to get, which is it doesn't have to be antagonistic, but it absolutely needs to be child-centred. And where it's not right, that we are listening and hearing what's being said, but work together to find a solution. I think Plymouth, um, it's a very, I found it a very warm place and people um, aren't backwards and coming forward anyway. Um, but it's just making sure and reasserting that these are the mechanisms, use them, we will learn from them, and we can have a debate and a dialogue about it. So I think it's constantly just making that okay, have that conversation, put the challenge in, and let's have a conversation in partnership. Thank you. Is that a follow-up, Councillor Poyser? No, thank you. So, Councillor Creswell. Um, I just wanted to ask about the um, issue of uh, domestic abuse, especially that more complex aspect of domestic abuse, which talks about um, coercive control. And I just wondered, I, I realise you've got that down, it is partly a, a government response, but what do you actually have in place to, um, to develop understanding and knowledge about various uh, partnerships and bodies of, about understanding about the wider aspect of domestic, domestic uh, violence, domestic abuse? There is, um, it's a pity that Emma's left. Emma, our commissioning manager, um, is just looking at the domestic abuse provision and the contracts across the city. 
and we were doing an ironic a meeting yesterday around that in terms of our approach, what we need to commission, how does the system work. So I think there is a paper coming to s uh, to cabinet shortly around that and around the, the ongoing strategy and, and what needs to happen. Um, so that's from a council point of view. But Carl, you might want to add to that. Just to offer some reassurance that we've got a specific training program within the partnership that is focused on domestic abuse. It wasn't. It, it has been a priority at times within the partnership as well, and those priorities change. Um, but um, there has been a real focus on trying to upskill the workforce and understand particularly what you refer to around coercive control. Um, and I know there's been lots of information shared recently on principal social worker of the um, children's social care has really emphasised the focus on that across the children's social care workforce. And what we know is that that naturally then feeds out as well into the wider partnership. Thank you. Um, John, did you want to come in? Yeah, it's, um, thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Just to say the partnership uh, has to have a key relationship with the local community safety partnership as well. That's integral to this. So that's something that's in place with the partnership. So to make sure there is that understanding across our partnership uh, and contribution to any commissioning so that we sort of work as closely and complementary uh, with the safer community, community safety partnership as we can. So, yeah, there is a role very much for the partnership. I know that the council has its own particular requirements, uh, but there's something that's very strong within the partnership and we, you know, is a priority for us, whatever we do. So there's that additional connection between us. Thank you. Do you want to come back, Councillor Chris? That's, no, thank you. That's really helpful. It'd be really interesting to, um, to to see that paper. Thank you very much indeed. Councillor Tickets? Um, looking at the fact that the both of the young people uh, that their tragic murders uh, initiated this review were very young. Um, what are we doing in terms of age appropriate education for young people in primary school so they know what is and isn't okay at home and how they can safely report that? I think back to the keeping children safe in education, it's ongoing awareness, being alert, being open, <coughs> spotting the small signs, connecting the dots and being absolutely vigilant. Um, I, I, I think it's part of what we do. And, and again, in, in these particular circumstances, as, as Carl just outlined, but then if there are alerts, it gets to that multi-agency safeguarding hub and the processes and procedures and practice and dialogue at that place is really understanding what needs to happen now, but it's constant vigilance, constant awareness, and through the safeguarding leads in each and every setting. Jean, do you want to? I was going to give a specific example. So we've been working for a number of years with the NSPCC in order to reduce uh, the, uh, the level of an impact of sexual abuse across the city. And while they commenced with a place-based approach in Ernest Settle and really did an awful lot of work with that community, including children from a very young age, there is a, a regular range of events that happen, such as the PADS campaign that is very much targeted at primary school children in terms of raising awareness with children at a, 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 as young an age as possible so it becomes part of how they think about their safety. Um, and then the healthy relationships work that um, the NSPCC are doing across schools is reaching a younger and younger age of children, doing that in a really appropriate and sensitive way. But that's one example I'd give you in terms of how we are looking to reach out in a really effective way that's truly preventative uh, and gives children the opportunity to say uh, if there is something that is troubling them. Because we know that with an issue like sexual abuse, most of our activity to protect comes from some form of disclosure, whether it's through behaviour or something that they tell us. Is it okay to ask a supplementary chair? Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, if, the say, a, a child at primary school tells their teacher that they're safe, that it's their parent that's the <coughs> problem, is there still that what seems to me ludicrous requirement that that parents then phoned and told there's a safeguarding risk at home and if so what if what's being done to um make sure that we can keep children safe um by not alerting the person who is potentially abusing them that some, someone's spoken out i've got john first and then i come back to you jean 
John, are you joining us? Sorry, it's an old hand. Sorry, I'll, I'll take it down. Thanks, Gina. So there is a very clear guidance that um, comes from uh, the Children Act and is enshrined in Working Together uh, 2018 that guides uh, professionals about the thresholds and how that thresholds of harm and concern about children and how we respond. When it comes to concerns that are safeguarding, uh, where it's um, likely or possible that a child is going to uh, experience ongoing significant harm um, if disclosure to uh, a carer is made, um, there is uh, agreement within legislation, within the mandatory uh, guidance, that you don't have to seek consent from a parent in order to report that concern for investigation. Uh, and that's what uh, is often colloquially called as a Section 47 referral. So that is a contact with the local authority that says, I'm really concerned about this child. I haven't sought consent from the parent because I am concerned that if I do, the child is likely to be further harmed. So we have that enshrined in legislation and uh, professionals as part of their um, in-agency safeguarding training or as part of multi-agency safeguarding training would have that advice and guidance really clearly shared with them about when consent is appropriate and in most situations it's right to seek consent from families and to share information and talk through concerns with them so that we can find the least intrusive approach to supporting them in their care of their children to keep them safe at home but there are some situations where consent is dispensed with because of the safeguarding risk. And it's a judgment uh, in terms of that. There's no clear cut way of saying it's this side or that side of that, that discussion. So it's very much about how people talk about that together, get advice from experts and really think about the best approach. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Harrison, and then that will be the last question. Yes. Um, I I think it might be the safeguard before thinking about the partnership. I just wanted to check whether or not it's still in place that actually uh, if the police are called to a, 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 an incident of domestic abuse that the school is then contacted to let them know that something's happened overnight, for example, so that they're aware. Does that still happen? I can confirm that happens and we receive thousands of those um, uh, reports uh, each year from the police. It's a very active uh, uh, approach and it's called Operation Encompass for those who remember the original name of it. That information is shared uh, with the schools, with our gateway uh, in the local authority. So there's a, a way in which that is triangulated so that schools can take action. A, a very small percentage of those actually turn into uh, safeguarding referrals, but it's really great intelligence for schools and others to think about understanding what's happening for children when they come into school, what might be impacting on them, and what early help uh, support might need to be offered. Is there a question, Bob? No, no. Sorry, it's fine. We're, ne we're, we're nearly there. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Carl. I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think, you know, two truly horrific things that have happened. And it would be even more horrific if we weren't learning from those things. So I think it's really reassuring for us here in Plymouth to know that actually things have come out of that which will make sure that our children in Plymouth are protected. I don't know what others think, but the, um, <clears throat> the paper around domestic <coughs> abuse sounds very interesting. So I think if that could be circulated to members of the committee and maybe at the next committee, we could look at whether there's aspects of that around the bits that pertain to children and young people that we might want to consider at a, a, a future scrutiny committee. But um, yeah, thank you very much, Carl, very much. Um, it's really interesting and, and reassuring. So yeah, thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to the work programme now. I'll just whiz up. So, um, so November is going to be uh, yes, it is December. I did know that. Um, yeah, it's going to be very education heavy. Um, are we saying that all of this is going to go on there? So the white paper with mats, green paper. I mean, are the results on there? Because that's yeah, what we, yeah. So we want results, don't mm -hmm. we? 
Um, I think it's one yeah. to repeat it as it's yeah. just high level briefing, but it did. The main focus was around outcomes, wasn't it, and progress around it. But I think some of these we can, if if in the way that we've done today, provide the information and, and, and take questions for the information. There's a lot there, but I'm more than happy to prepare. Yeah, um, I wondered as well whether we can have a specific bit around our looked after children around attainment and results, a sort of discrete section. It doesn't have to be massive, but just so that we do look at that as a specific item. Sally? That's exactly what I wanted to ask. That's exactly what I wanted to ask. And at our last meeting, at our um, corporate parent meeting, we actually asked for a few other things, I think, to be incorporated into the, the data on um, on our children in care as well, which I think would be, would be really helpful, because I think it's important to look at them together with um, the, the wider provision as well and see how they're actually progressing as our... Uh, as you know, our children are progressing as uh, uh, against um, against all children within the unit. Does anybody else have any other comments about the work program? No. So that's yet. But um, I don't know if I need to be on camera for this. But um, I, this is Jean's last um, scrutiny before she leaves us to go to Oxford. Um, I did manage to make her tearful at the um, corporate parenting group so um, I just want to say a huge thank you I was on your chief officer appointment panel that appointed you and I knew that we needed to have you in Plymouth and I'm sure that that's exactly the feeling that the chief officer appointment panel in Oxford had when you sat before them um, a couple of months ago um, I've said what I said at, at uh, corporate parenting I just think what you've done to to really drive the improvement journey that we know we've got to go on um, has been incredible and you know you have made a difference to young people's lives and futures in this city and that can't be underestimated and I would like to say a huge personal thank but I'm sure from the committee too and you know through gritted teeth <laughs> to wish you uh, you know I know it's the right thing for you so it's absolutely what you must do but thank you very much for the three years you you've spent with Plymouth you've made a real difference thank you many thanks Jo. Yes, of course. It's also he, Ming's not here. It's also Ming's um, last um, scrutiny as well. So um, a huge thank you from me personally. I found working with Ming really fruitful. I, I find him very thoughtful, very thought provoking. Um, he always makes me think about things. And, you know, when I think I've made my mind up, I can have a conversation with Ming. And he, you know, he does really make me think. Um, uh, so, yeah, just to wish Ming also... Um, huge good luck for his future and thank you very much for the time that he has spent in Plymouth the stuff around the early years board has been really important and I know will be really important going forward um so again he's made an impact in Plymouth and, and we'll miss him and wish him a lot of luck thank you very much for that reminder it's because he wasn't up on my screen and I can't bear him he's leaving but yeah thank you and uh, thank you very much to everybody today. Uh, only 10 minutes over, which is, I think is my best time so far. Councillor Harrison. Yeah, sorry. I just wanted to check, because the times of the meetings have, have changed um, to now being in the middle of the day. Is that ongoing, that the, the meetings are going to be in the What's middle of the day? Just, it's because of, it's just, I think it was to get this one in, because it was... Um, a, a, a rearrange because of the death of the Queen. I think we're we reverting to the normal time for December. So the November no, we'll be back meeting is also is also in the middle of the day. Yes, and then is it? Yes, it is. It's because we couldn't have key officers at that November meeting. It just makes it more difficult yeah. when you're trying to. No, work I do. I do. I do appreciate that, and I appreciate you coming on that yeah, basis. I'll go back to work. I know. I'm sorry, um, <laughs> but it will be back to normal in February. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, That's thank you. Thank and thank you very, you very much, much everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah,